and the, the paths and all the things that we're going to go through in this, uh, I wanted to point out that this is very much a choose your own adventure. You can do exactly what's said in there with a few tweaks, uh, or you can go off and do your own thing, whatever it is. We can talk about, uh, talk about the uh, extracurricular stuff at the end if you guys like. Um, and that's that. Whoa. That's not what I wanted. Is that why it just freaked out? Yep. How do I PowerPoint? I forgot how to get started on my there it is. Oh, once again. Oh, I see. Okay. Cool. We already did some introductions. Um, yeah, welcome to Kubernetes 101. Let's get started. <laughs> so what is Kubernetes? This is an open source platform for automating development, scaling, and operations of application containers across clusters of hosts, providing a container-centric infrastructure for managing your workload. Uh, what I mean by container-centric is Pretty much everything that you're going to do in this infrastructure is going to be orchestrated through containers of some sort. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways to define them, to run them, to manage them, and that's what we're going to be going through today. Sorry for some of the wall of text in here, but uh, here's some history. Uh, the name Kubernetes is Greek for helmsman, uh, and they have the, the pronunciation there. Uh, it was founded by a bunch of ex-Google engineers, uh, and they were open sourced in 2014. Um, originally this was designed uh, internally at Google, they called it the Borg system, this was how they were managing their globally distributed workload. And uh, many of the top contributors to this project previously worked on Borg. The original code name for this was Project 7, which was a reference to a Star Trek character, the nice Borg, right? And uh, the seven spokes on the wheel of the Kubernetes logo is a nod to that code name. Uh, don't forget we have donuts. All right. So, uh, before we get started with what Kubernetes is and, and what Docker actually is, I wanted to go through uh, a real quick spiel on what I think a uh, effective design for an application looks like inside of a container. Uh, I've seen a lot of times where people want to take a server where they've had five, eight, ten daemons running at once, throw them all in a container and lift it in the cloud. This doesn't work. This is not the right design. We have to think about containers differently. 12-factor uh, application design is what I call properly designed apps for a container environment. Uh, the reason we do this is because when, when you design properly, the containers can be deployed and managed in a very flexible and automatic way. Uh, ultimately providing greater uptime of your app, better and more predictable performance, and all with less hands-on management. What we're going to do uh, for the rest of this course is explore containers in Docker. We'll get you up and running with a single node cluster using Minikube. And by the end of the course, you'll be able to launch a collection of containers called a pod to serve a local internet radio station using open source software, Icecast, and a few uh, sidecar containers, uh, MPD, YMPD, and SEMA. They're all things that work together to make the broadcast possible. So, what is this class not? This class is not uh, really about, it's not going to focus on multi-node deployments. We're not going to really focus on the rest of the ecosystem. Uh, Prometheus, Alert Manager, Sidecar Pod, pod Design, uh, Release Management with Helm, uh, which is a really nifty thing. And uh, I don't, we don't really have time today to talk cloud provisioners or their annotations, how to automatically get magic set up in the cloud. Uh, there is a section at the end to discuss this stuff, but I don't have anything prepared. That'll be very much freeform when we get down there. Uh, that's the productionization conversation. Uh, a, pretty much all of this course was taken from uh, the authority sites, right? Kubernetes.io, Docker.io. Uh, I've, I found a few wiki, uh, wikis and blogs and things out on the internet that I, I borrowed to put in the slides here. Uh, the community is awesome. 
This technology is always evolving. They just released 1.6. Uh, they are on a basically like a one week release cycle these days. Uh, they're releasing minor versions all the time. They're fixing stuff. They're breaking stuff. They're back and forth all the time. So get involved. Uh, if you guys clone the repository earlier, uh, in the wiki, in that HTML document, if you open it up at the very bottom of the, s of the page that comes up when you open the doc, at the very bottom is resources. It's, uh, the wiki is called TiddlyWiki. The little objects are called Tiddlers. So the bottom Tiddler is the resources section. Uh, that's basically everywhere that I pulled all this information from. Uh, you guys can check that out at your leisure. Uh, that also includes links to the uh, Slack rooms for all of the special interest groups that contribute to the design of the system. Uh, this is where they solve all their problems. They're actively talking about all of the things that they want to do with the system. So if you guys are interested in getting involved, that's where you do it. All right, so why are containers cool? Uh, the old way of, de of developing and deploying applications was you had, if each gray box here is a server, the server has a kernel, you install a bunch of libraries on the system, and then you run your apps on top of it, right? Maybe these are daemons, or maybe one-time whatever workloads. Uh, when you need a new application server, you order a box, you wait three weeks, you localize it, you install users, you install whatever else you need, right? And then you install your code on top of it, and especially if you have an expensive server, you want to get the most out of it, right? So you're going to deploy multiple applications, hopefully all using the same frameworks and, and all of that. Uh, we call this the old way of doing things because uh, you really can't manage this as dynamically as we would like to. So let's talk about the difference between that and deploying containers. When you have a container, it's, it's one server, right, with one kernel. You got your operating system running, but then you're running helper software to localize all of the things that your application requires in order to perform its workload. You've got what all of the libraries that would otherwise be installed in your host OS. You're building that into the container so that the container itself is self-sufficient. You don't need extra stuff. It runs the same way no matter where you're deploying it. it you know, you get a, these are all of the things that contribute to ease of management, uptime, flexibility, all of that. So, let's talk some more about why 12 Factor is so effective in a containerized environment. Uh, straight from 12factor.net, the 12 Factor app is a methodology for building software as a service apps that use declarative formats to set up automation. Uh, there are all kinds of benefits to this. One of them is that it minimizes the uh, time and cost for new developers to get up to speed on the project. Instead of saying, you need these seven libraries, go install them, you can say, uh, here's, here's a script that defines everything that you need, go run it. When you use 12-factor, you have a clean contract with the underlying operating system, offering maximum portability between execution environments. Uh, this is important because when you have containers and a clustered environment, not all the time will your container be running on one single server, right? Maybe you're scaling, maybe you have 12 of one type of container. They're never going to be running on the same system in a, in a well-distributed environment. So having the ability to take one container, throw it over there, and not lose connectivity to your application is very important. 12-factor uh, develop, 12-factor uh, apps are suitable for deployment on modern cloud platforms. Uh, one of the interesting things about cloud platforms is that when you provision a system, you really can't just expect that system to be alive for the duration of that application's lifespan like you would a physical server that you deploy into a data center or something, right? Uh, if you run your own VMware cluster, you have maybe containers, maybe systems, whatever, but they're otherwise long-lived. They sit there, they do their work. If you need to interact with it, you can log into the console or whatever. With cloud providers, that's not true. Uh, you can log in, you can interact with it, but you can't rely on it being up all the time. Hardware fails, uh, Amazon in particular, if, you, if you're in US East, uh, that's their original data center, that's their oldest hardware, it's the highest failure rate. You're gonna be moving systems all the time, we gotta know how to deal with that in, a, in, a, in an easy way. Uh, this also minimizes divergence between environments. 
when you have a hand-built production environment and you have a new developer and you say we want to get you up to speed as quickly as possible here's what production looks like go build it in dev for yourself right that this is an amazingly steep learning curve typically uh, it takes a long time to get up and running and time is money right so we want an easy way to spin people up on this platform uh, and finally the 12-factor app can scale up without significant changes to tooling, architecture, or development practices. Uh, again, getting up and running as fast as possible uh, without significant changes to the ways that we manage the application itself. Uh, we'll go quickly through what the 12-factors are so that we can get an idea of, uh, of the things that define a well-designed container. Uh, I'm going to run through these walls of text pretty quickly. Sorry, sorry that I don't have them broken out and any better. Um, step one, always track your code in a revision control system. I like Git. SFS uses GitLab. Uh, they're all great tools. They all interact the same way. Uh, for the uninitiated, a code base is any single repo or set of repos who share a root commit. Uh, it's always a one-to-one -one correlation between the code base and the app. If you have multiple code bases, then then that's a distributed system, right? Uh, when we talk about apps, we want to focus on the single purpose of that app. It should be, it should be, uh, it should be ha just have one single focus. And if it needs something else, that's a backing service. Uh, and we can talk about that here in a little bit. A 12-factor app uh, can explicitly declare and isolate its dependencies. Uh, this is one of those things that helps you be portable, helps you ramp up quickly. Uh, no matter what the tool chain is, dependency declaration and isolation must always be used together. One or the other is not a complete solution. Right? Uh, a few examples are with Python, you have pip for package management and virtual m for the isolation. Uh, in Ruby, you have gem files and bundle execs. Um, every language has its way of doing things. Uh, it all depends on your workload. Uh, one last thing here, no dropping shells. If you're dropping shell in a container so that you can Execute, execute system calls, then you're doing it wrong. We need, to, we need to bundle those services in with the app to make sure that in the event a container gets scheduled on a node without that tool, that the application can still run. Configurations are super important. Uh, this is what handles the differences between deployments. Um, Example configurations include resource handles to databases or, or memcached or whatever other backing services. Uh, credentials should never be in the code. They should always be in a configuration somewhere. Um, and probably not in plain text. You're probably going to want to do uh, some trickery to get it in a secure store, maybe read in some environment variables, apply it to the config at deploy time, uh, something like that. Um, Configurations vary substantially across deployments, but the code should not. The code should be the same, no matter how you're deploying. Uh, yeah, we often use environment variables for storing this stuff. Number four, backing services. We should treat all backing services as attached resources. That is, uh, that is, you should be able to see a resource by some identifier, a DNS name, an IP address, whatever, uh, from within your container. Uh, backing services are pretty much any service that the app consumes over the network. Uh, that can be connecting to data stores, uh, hitting queuing systems, using mail, whatever. Uh, there should be no distinction between local and third-party services. If it's a local service, you should still talk to it the same way. Um, this ensures distributability, right? If we're, uh, if we're on some other node across the world, but we want to talk to this one service, we've got to be able to hit it by a name, no matter where we're at. That will ensure that your application is stable. Um, yeah, you should be able to attach and detach resources at will. Uh, and uh, for example, if you have a misbehaving app, uh, you ought to be able to spin up a new database, restore from backup, whatever it is, attach your, your application to the database and continue going, all without code changes. If you can do this, you're on the right track. Build, release, and run steps should be strictly separated. The idea is that build stage transforms the code repo into an executable. That's your build. Uh, and you should have IDs for what the builds are. The release stage takes the build and combines it with the configuration. 
Uh, this gives you otherwise a running app, but it's not running yet until after it's deployed, and then that's the run stage or the runtime. That's when your app is executing in the environment uh, with all of the things that it needs, backing services, configurations, and, and all of that. Uh, when you strictly separate these, in, these steps, you get the ability to roll back fairly easily, uh, and with unique release IDs, uh, you can see the history of how your thing evolved and, and easily roll back and stuff like that. As I said earlier, each app should be one single process. Uh, a few other reasons that we do this are, uh, are that, well, I, got, I skipped ahead, sorry. Uh, we should be executing the applications as one or more stateless processes. Um, they should share nothing. Any data that you need should not be part of the container. It should be outside of it in some data store. Uh, yeah. If you're a web developer and you like sticky sessions, we can't be doing that here. That's the wrong thing for containers. We gotta use a data store like Memcached or Redis or something like that. Uh, port binding. To get your service exposed, we should always be using port binding. Um, it's a bit of an abstract concept uh, when we talk about containers, uh, especially within the context of Kubernetes because uh, there are many different ways and types of, ex uh, of exposing your ports. Uh, but for the purposes here, Anytime you're going to uh, use a service or, or provide a service, it should be through a port binding. Uh, this happens in a configuration. It's code. This is how we can think of infrastructure as code. Uh, everything you do should be committed and reviewable, and uh, it shouldn't really change significantly between the flows. Uh, one of the reasons we do the, the single process model is so that we can uh, significantly simplify the scale out process. Uh, if you have, if you have a well-designed application of a couple of containers, let's say, uh, and you reach the limit of your ability to serve, then with well-defined, uh, with well-designed applications, you can simply add more workers for some particular function, throw it behind a name, and you should be able to scale extremely easily this way. Uh, all of our containers, as I said earlier, are disposable. We can't expect them to be there in a cloud environment, right? So when we design properly, our containers are disposable, that uh, we get fast startup and graceful shutdown. Uh, we should not expect any of these to be long-lived. We should design for failure. We should know how to recover. Additionally, in terms of getting up and running quickly, uh, when you have all of the dependencies built into a container, your environments suddenly become very easy to manage. Uh, so we can ensure dev, production, QA, whatever environment parity, and everyone is happier when this is the case. Logs are super important for any application. Uh, anytime your application is malfunctioning, the first place you're gonna go is probably logs. However, don't send it to a log file, especially not within the container. Uh, we should treat logs as event streams, and preferably, you would have some kind of log aggregate, uh, log analysis system downstream to review, discover what actually happened, see trends over time, things like that. Uh, some of my favorites include Splunk and the Elk stack. Uh, for SFS, I think Elk is going to be real interesting. Elasticsearch log stash Kibana. Uh, it's an open source solution for uh, analysis. It's really simple to set up. It's really cool and powerful. Uh, maybe we could do a class on that some of the time. And finally, one-off processes. Uh, if you've got to migrate a database, or if you need a live console session, or run a one-off fixer-upper script for your data set, whatever it is, we should always be using the same dependency isolation technique that we talked about earlier. That's if you're using Python, pip, and virtual env, get your get your one-off processes isolated in the same way as your application. That way, anytime you need to touch your app, if you need to, hopefully you don't, but anytime you need to touch your app, you're doing it in the same way that your application knows how to run it. And that is gonna ensure greater happiness for everyone. All right, with that, off to the Docker lab. Let's see. Yes. So as a DevOps person, 
Kristen, how much control do you have over developers doing their work the way they should be so it's <laughs> Yeah, sure. Uh, great question. Uh, all depends on the organization. The way I see it, uh, as a DevOps engineer, if you're, if you're practicing DevOps uh, to its fullest, then you are working with development teams to get your application uh, built and launched in the first place, right? Uh, in that case, you have a lot of control, right? You can say things like, um, like we have eight daemons, they can't all be in one container, let's break them down into mi in microservices, uh, and that way we can manage each one separately. Uh, like I said, every place is different. You don't always have that ability, uh, but particularly if you're in, so, in a sort of an older operations model type environment, uh, then usually operations is, is saddled with supporting the application, right? If you're supporting the application, then I think you have even more uh, ammunition to enforce better design because you, then you have the data to say, all of our applications operate this way with this latency, with this performance characteristic. Uh, these are our, this is where we're at. Here's our targets. We're not there. Here's what I think we can do to get there, right? So in many ways, you are part of the development team, right? Uh, I, I think that if you're if you're practicing DevOps to its fullest, yes, absolutely. Uh, if you if you're not, perhaps uh, it's a shop that wants to be more DevOpsy but isn't quite there yet. Uh, then then the way I've seen it, you're, t you're traditionally more on the support side. So just a couple of different ways to look at it. Uh, ideally, yeah, you'd be part of the development process. Is that uh, repository we need to get, uh, do the get Yeah. If you go down to, let's see, where am I? There we go. Uh, so I'm Mars64 on GitHub. You go to github.com slash Mars64. I only have one repo, k8s-music-stack. That's got all the stuff in here. All right, so let's move on to the Docker Lab. Unless we have any other questions, we good? Cool. This is one of those uh, choose your own adventure uh, labs. We've got uh, very much a zero to 100 lab here. We're gonna start with the super easy stuff of uh, just just pulling a random container that can echo something as a hello world. Then we move into uh, what more advanced containers look like. We've got an Nginx uh, example. Then we m look at building our own container, pushing it up to a repo, and referring to it as we pull containers down and run it locally. And then finally, we've got the, uh, the IceCast stack that we can launch using Docker Compose. Um, so first, what is Docker? Docker uh, runs containers based on images to perform your workload. An image is the lightweight standalone executable package that everything that includes everything needed to run a piece of software. That's all of your code, the runtime, the libraries, any any stack stuff that you need. Uh, also, all the environment variables and config files. This is your deployment, right? Um, or sorry, the, this is your image. The deployment is, comes in the form of the container. This is the runtime instance of that image. Uh, so we've got this fancy little Docker graph here from docker.io. The daemon runs on your system. There's a REST API on top of it. Uh, and then we use the Docker command line interface to, to issue commands uh, to manage our, our workloads. Docker Engine is a client server app, uh, and it has it has these major components. It's a server, which is a, long, a type of long-running program. It is a daemon, the Docker D. Uh, it's got a REST API, which specifies interfaces and uh, anything you want to do, you, get, you do it through the API. They've got clients. You can write your own, whatever you want. Uh, and then there's the CLI interface, which basically just uh, takes commands, launches them at the, at the API, and that's how we, that's how we do it. So, here's a very simple example of a hello world. Uh, I start with the Docker login. Uh, I don't think you technically need it yet, but once we get logged in, all the better. Uh, does anyone not have a Docker Hub account or a GitHub account? Good, cool, so we're all there. 
Once we log in, uh, we can run Docker images and we can see that we don't actually have uh, any images in our local repo. I do believe that that is hard to read. Let's see. Uh, let's see, what are we doing? So I've got a bunch of images from developing this class. Uh, yours might be empty if this is the first time you've run this. Uh, Docker images will list all the images that you have, uh, that you've pulled, that you have some layer cached for that, uh, that, your, that your local daemon knows about. Uh, we can populate them by pulling stuff, by building stuff, whatever. Uh, Docker PS, on the other hand, shows you what containers you have actually running at the moment. Uh, we can get more information about that. Nothing running at the moment? Cool. When you, when you pull and interact with containers, uh, they come by default straight from Docker Hub. Uh, so in this case, we can pull the Hello World container. Uh, pull Hello World. And my image is up to date. Uh, you might see some different output if you don't have this container locally. And then when we run Docker images, we see, well, <laughs> my list is a little messy, but uh, if you didn't have anything before, you'll see that you now have the Hello World container. And now to run it, we've got the name, it's Hello World. To run it, we just run Docker run Hello World. Docker run Hello World. This container has one purpose, echo this. That's all it does. When it's done with that, the container exits. As you can see, I've got no running containers at the moment. So, my little mind blown icon here. <laughs> what we did was we demonstrated that retrieving an existing image on Docker Hub and running the short-lived container to a basic end. We echoed text to standard out. That's all we did. When the workload was done, the container exited. So how did that work? The Hello World container, which you can find on Docker Hub, is built from this Docker file, very simple Docker file. From scratch, copy hello, run, run it, do the thing. Um, the hello binary was uh, crafted specifically for this hello world. If you're, more, if you're interested in what it is, how it was built, they've got all the information on the hello world uh, site from Docker. Uh, Scratch is an explicitly empty image. It's, it's a way to demonstrate uh, containers and how to manage them. Uh, and yeah, to generate this output message, the Docker client hit the Docker daemon, it pulled the Hello World image from Docker Hub, then it created the new container from the image, ran the executable, and the executable said, spew some text, here it is. All right, so we can explore a little bit more. Uh, all kinds of different operating systems have their own containers pre-built. For example, Ubuntu, we can just docker run Ubuntu. Now, this dash ti gives us an interactive terminal, uh, an interactive TTY. Uh, Ubuntu is the image name. When you're running interactively, you have to give the command that you want to run to the container, otherwise it'll just exit, because there is no primary process, right? So our primary process here is going to be bash. Voila! All of a sudden, uh, what am I at? Debian. Ubuntu? Yeah, Debian. Now I'm, I'm running a container straight from Docker Hub, which is a build of Ubuntu. I'm launching the bash process which by the way you can see is PID1. As soon as PID1 completes, the container exits. We can do anything we want from within this container uh, and everything uh, about, about the internal operating system is at our disposal. Uh, we've got everything from apt-get to you know, basic Linux, whatever. This is a full image of Ubuntu. When I exit, we can see that the container exits as well. All right, for, for a little bit more interesting demo, let's take a look at the container appropriate slash curl. Now appropriate slash curl, that's, that's a Docker Hub URL. 
uh, appropriate is the repo, curl is the container. So if we just run it and and give it a dash version, the container itself will automatically run curl. That's what the container was designed to do. If you give it dash dash version, it'll run curl dash dash version, and we can see that we're actually with inside the container uh, using the software that was built into it. So we're running curl 7.52.1. Uh, it's based on Alpine Linux using the MUSL name resolution library. Uh, here's all the protocols it, it talks. Once again, the PID1 exits, the container exits. Now we can, uh, for example, use the container to curl a site, ifconfig.me. Uh, this is basically the equivalent of whatsmyip.com, except it's a curlable, uh, clean interface. So let's docker run, appropriate curl, ifconfig.me. Hopefully, there we go. And there's Wilson's public IP address, if anybody wants it for fun games. You can pull all kinds of containers straight from various registries. By default, it's Docker Hub. You don't have to pull from Docker Hub. You can point it at any container registry, um, get all kinds of containers. There, I, I really haven't found uh, much generic use uh, for building any container that I need. Uh, pretty much everything I need is already built out there. So uh, if you're going to write a new app, you're probably extending a container that already exists. Let's do a little bit more interesting example. Uh, let's pull Nginx and set up a little, little website thingy. <laughs> I, at this point, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it might take a while for everyone to pull all these things. Uh, yeah, I guess I should also put out there that the uh, the containers, the the images that were built for the IceCast project, total file size is about 550 megs. That's really small in the grand scheme of things, but with all of us pulling at once over this poor little consumer network uh, might take a little while so if you guys want to get started on that it might be a good thing. <laughs> yeah this is uh, a little slower than I was hoping. Uh, I guess while this is going a note about about container sizes. Uh, you can build containers out of pretty much any distro ever. Some distros are bigger than others, right? We pulled an entire Ubuntu image down. Uh, to do the last piece of this. Uh, Nginx, I mean, software doesn't just run on its own, right? Software needs an operating system to tell it what to do. Even if that operating system is part of the container, it's still an OS. Uh, some containers are built with full-blown every library that comes with a default OS, like Ubuntu or Red Hat or CentOS or whatever. Uh, others come with uh, more streamlined operating systems. For example, we saw earlier that curl was built on Alpine Linux. Alpine is known for being a very small footprint. Uh, all of the IceCast uh, containers that I built for this are all based on Alpine. Uh, that's about as small as I can get these containers at the moment. So, All right, so we have Nginx latest. Now what we're going to do is uh, the, choose your, the choose your own adventure piece of this is, uh, is more around paths. Uh, I like to make a directory called code in my home directory and I work out of there. Um, as you can see, code is comprised of uh, just whatever I'm working on at the time. Um, so this is where I keep all my repositories, this is where I check stuff out at. Uh, the reason this is significant is because when it comes time to run some of the commands later, some of the paths won't be the same as what I have. So match your environments, we can talk about that when we get to it. Uh, all right, so we have this nginx example. We have this nginx example. I created a directory here, nginx underscore example. 
and I have this file, index.html. I just catted some text to it. Uh, very simple file, there's no HTML shell, it's nothing, it's just text, right? With that, what we can do is run the Nginx container, we'll volume mount the directory that we created into the directory that Nginx knows to look for its index file at, uh, we'll detach the container so that we can exit the container without killing PID1, uh, we'll map a couple of ports, and then we'll give it a name. I call it Nginx Donkey because, because why not? Name, Nginx Donkey, whatever. We're going to volume mount. So for here, I'm using my home directory code, kates.101, Nginx example. And then the convention is you give source path, destination path in the container. So there's my source path, colon, uh, and where do we mount this to? User share Nginx HTML. Uh, oh, and we have some permissions here. We're going to mount that as read only, as such. Uh, then we also uh, have this dash dash rm. Oops. Uh, rm removes the container when it's done processing. We're going to detach uh, our TTY when we exit instead of killing PID1. And finally, we're going to map port 8080 to 80 inside the container. There's no SSL, it's just HTTP. Uh, and then I'm going to give it the name of the container that I want to run. We just pulled down Nginx, so let's just run Nginx. Now, we detached, so that means that Nginx is running in the background. If we do a Docker PS, now we can see that stuff is there, right? If I want to jump into the container to do something, we can docker exec, and then use the container ID and then give it the command. We're going to run bash or whatever, right? Here we are in the container. We exit, the container's still running. Now we also know that, let's see here, can I do this? No. Uh, well, if we curl localhost at the port that we mounted, 8080, the donkey mounts at midnight. So what did we do here? We pulled down a container. Uh, we created a index file for this web server to serve. We volume mounted the path to that directory into the container. We port mapped, uh, we exposed the service via port binding, right? 8080 forward to 80 inside the container. Uh, and then we hit the web server at the locally exposed address of 8080. Now, this is a Docker container. It's running directly on my host. The local host port 8080 is bound. That means I can't bind anything else to it, right? Uh, every, as far as this computer is concerned, that port is consumed and I can't use it anymore. Uh, because the container has been detached, in order to end the container, let's get the ID, and then we just docker stop that ID. Docker PS, we see that the container exits. Morris, can you bind any port to the any arbitrary port to the to the container um, like for Nginx is port eighty can I map ninety one to uh, yes, if you have an app, like for example, if you have an Nginx configuration that exposes a service over some funky port inside the container, yeah, you just point it at that port and whatever the locally bound port to that port is is how you will talk to it. Uh, I believe you can bind any local port. Uh, you may need permissions if it's a known port, right? Uh, one through whatever, 10, 24, or whatever it is, yeah. Uh, and by the way, we will see this a little bit later as well with the IceCast uh, example, because we're going to expose uh, two ports, I think, on two non-standard ports for whatever this thing is doing. So we can take a look at that later. And just to review, since we started the container in detached mode with dash D, the container continued to process until the main process exited. But in this case, it didn't. We killed it. We did a Docker stop container ID block.
All right. Uh, I'm going to run through this one uh, just talking about it because uh, I, I think that everyone understands what's happening here. And uh, if we all try to push our containers up to Docker, Docker Hub at once, it may not. We might be sitting here for a while. So uh, how can we build our own containers? Uh, we use a Docker file to define where we start from and each layer, each change that we want to make to that file uh, before building it and then pushing it to the hub, to the Docker hub. Uh, in this case, if let's say we wanted to build an Nginx container, we can say that we're building the container from Nginx latest. It doesn't have to be latest. We can version pin if we want. Generally, I recommend against it. Uh, but so from here, we're going to go grab the latest Nginx uh, container. We're going to set our work directory where we're going to where we're going to work from uh, as we build the container to user share nginx html. Uh, for example, we could add a file. Now this file has to be alongside the Docker file for it to know where how to get it. But we can add if we have a file nginx example, we can add it to the directory uh, that we're going to serve from. Then we can expose 80. This is the important part to your question. Uh, we, this is where the container knows what port it, it should say to its to the next hop, to, the, to its hypervisor, to whatever, that, hey, I'm serving stuff over this port, over this port number. Uh, that exposes it from within the container. To connect it, you use the Docker port binding. Once the container starts up, the command line tells it what to do, what to create as PID1, what to think about uh, as the primary service. Right. As soon as this command exits, this is PID1, that means that the container exits. So in this case, we're just running Nginx, uh, not as a daemon. We don't need to because that's what our container is going to do for us, is manage it in that way. Uh, and in this case, we're using a default configuration. So it knows to look at user share Nginx HTML. And whatever content we mounted into the, to the container, that's what it's going to serve. Now that we've got our Docker file in place, we can build it with Docker build. The most important thing I want to illustrate here is tagging. Tagging is super critical. You have to tag everything. Um, depending, on, depending on your workflow, you can tag differently. But as long as you've got a tag, you've got a way to reference your, your version of the container, it's very important, uh, as we'll see later with our Kubernetes manifests. When you build, you give it a dash T, the tag, or the, sorry, the name of the uh, image, colon, the tag, and then the path to where the Docker file and everything that the Docker file references is going to be. In this case, it's just right here, this directory, right? Um, by convention, always use the, uh, if you're pushing to Docker Hub at least, uh, always use your username slash the image name. And then I like to use latest uh, in this case. If you have versioned, uh, if you have versions of your app, then label them accordingly, uh, refer to them however it is that you label them. Uh, in this case, using latest is easy. There are some cases where it gets a little wonky, but, uh, but yeah. In this output here, we can see what our Docker file did. Step one, grab the Nginx, uh, oh, oops. Well, this is the Nginx Alpine container. Our Docker file said Nginx latest. Uh, I must have changed something around in here, my bad. So we grab the Nginx Alpine container. We set the work directory. We've added a file into user share nginx HTML. Uh, we've exposed port 80. And then we, run, we tell the container that it should run this command at the end. If all is well, we've successfully built. And it'll give you a UID of the container uh, that you can reference later. Once your container is built, you can push it. Again, by default, this is, goes to the Docker Hub, but it could be any repo or any, uh, sorry, registry is what they're called. Uh, you just docker push the name of your image, in this case, mars64 slash nginx donkey, and then the tag. The, all of that information is available in the registry. Uh, so you can go there, look at history, look at different versions and stuff like that. So let's go check out real quick my docker hub. So as you can see, I've got a couple of, of images here on the hub. Let's see if we can uh, Down here at the bottom, Mars64, Nginx Donkey. If 
if we click it, we can see a few things. I haven't uh, actually filled in the repo information here. Please always fill in the readme information for people who are curious. Um, I'm not, I didn't do that properly. Uh, if you go over to tags, these are the list of tags that you apply to your image. I've only got latest. Uh, I'm not worried about, about versions of this thing because it's such a simple example. It's just catting out a file, right, to Nginx to serve a, a very simple thing. Uh, more complicated applications, though, you probably want to do versioning. You probably want to point at latest. Uh, it all depends on the application at that point. So, I know that I've got a thing in the Docker Hub at Mars64 slash Nginx Donkey. I'm logged into Docker Hub. So, oops. So, now I can refer to that image remotely and I can just run things from wherever. I don't have to have the, the container locally, or I don't have to have the image locally. I can launch it by pointing at my repo now that I'm logged in, right? So since I already have the container there, let's just go ahead and do that real quick. Docker run, give it a name. I called it donk donk. And just so that we know what we're referring to, again, we're gonna detach, remove when it's done, find some ports, and then we just refer to the image. Uh, Nginx donkey. And poof. Now we've built an image, we push it to the Docker Hub, and we're running it based on the name that we gave it. And here it is, and uh, yeah, we can exec into it, launch bash, do whatever we gotta do. Let's call that good for now. Cool. So what we did here, uh, yeah, just reviews. We uh, we launched a container, and it's very awesome. Now here's where stuff gets cool. We're gonna we're gonna build a local IceCast system using containers that were built by Vitaman, uh, and he did some really great work to get this four container uh, system going. Except he did it in Docker, and he did it using a tool called Docker Compose. Docker Compose is uh, sort of a it's, it's a way to orchestrate containers, but it's not nearly as flexible as a Kubernetes system, right? So we can use Docker Compose to launch multiple containers at once that all talk to each other to do a, a specific task. Um, what, I, what I intend to illustrate here is multiple containers working together to provide a service, okay? So, let's see, do I dare run through this stuff? I think so. Let's do it. Workflows uh, swarm uh, the same as the as or is that a different Docker tool? So actually, I think James could speak more to yeah, swarm so, than I could. So basically, like think about swarm as like you're treating like your fleet of, of Docker daemons, like um, many, potentially many services, as like groups of servers that you can deploy containers to. It's not as flexible or as like fully featured as Kubernetes, so it's like a different methodology of um, orchestrating containers. So, but it's also like, uh, just kind of builds in your, it's part of the Docker ecosystem, so you can more easily get up to speed with that if you're not as familiar with Kubernetes. However, these days with things like Minikube, uh, it's actually pretty easy just to start up a Kubernetes VM and get sort of the to so, yeah. uh, for the description of the class, one of the things that I put out there was, let's learn about containers, but then let's learn why containers are only half the problem, right? Swarm, Docker Compose, uh, was it Fleet, a couple of the other ones, really what they're doing is deploying containers sort of in a, in a one-way fashion. Uh, I like to think of it as it's old school operations with new school technology, right? We deploy a thing, we expect it to be long-standing, uh, if you got to support it, then you are either logging in or you're go or you know you're either logging into the container to support the thing live or you're redeploying over your old deployment by hand uh, stuff like that there are pl uh, platforms and scripts and things to automate a lot of this work um, but as james said it's not native to docker uh, kubernetes on the other hand is built to solve these problems 
So that's that's why containers only have the issue. Let's see what we can do here. I'm going to create a new directory called Vitaman. And let's pull Vitaman slash Docker music stack. I think. Nope. Oh, right. Right. So, uh, by default, IceCast can only read 128 kilobyte per second files, uh, music files. Um, in the spirit of open source and, and not violating uh, intellectual property, I threw up a few tunes that I, I've written in the past. Uh, they're up on my site, rinseandrepeatradio.com. Um, I wanted to grab a couple of songs just to demonstrate with. Uh, so that's where, they, that's where they're at. Let's go ahead and I'm going to make a directory called music. And then I'm just going to pull down these files with curl. Oops. They're all just a couple of megabytes, so that one's easy. So that's in music. Back in the Vitaman directory, we're going to, oh, oops, I did it wrong. We're going to clone, clone Vitaman's repository. This has Docker files and a Docker Compose script for orchestrating this stack. Let's see if we can do this. Cool. So if we change into the Docker music stack directory, we can see we've got these four directories down here, IceCast, MPD, SEMA, and YMPD, uh, these are the directories that hold the Docker files and the things that uh, the Docker files refer to, configurations. The IceCast config is in there as an XML file, MPD is in there, mpd.conf, ympd.conf, etc. Um, the Docker Compose scripts up here are what we're going to use to launch each of these containers locally. And let's take a look at what that thing actually does. So, uh, this is a file written in YAML for format, Y-A-M-L, uh, YAML ain't markup language, or whatever it stands for. Uh, spacing is very important in YAML. Uh, as we can see here, version services start all the way to the left. For each, uh, each object underneath it, it's invented out two spaces. So, we've got a service here, we can give it any name we want, we're calling it IceCast here. It's going to pull the image Vitamin Alpine Icecast latest. It's going to bind a port, and this is a Docker Compose thing. Uh, Docker is going to build a, a local network called Music Stack, and this uh, Docker Compose script is going to connect the containers to that network. Here's the next image we're going to run MPD, which came from this image, bind, bound on these ports. Uh, it depends on this service, so uh, MPD won't start until IceCast is ready. Uh, it connects to the same network, and here's our volume mounts. This is one of those places that we need to mind our paths. So, we will go ahead and open another thing here. Oops, let's see. Uh, maybe not, maybe I'll do it this way. Alright, code. Yeah. Alright. Uh, so, let's go to the Docker Music Stack, and I'm going to, or no, I want to be over here, Music. So here's my path. My path. Always use um, absolute paths. You don't want to use uh, sim, uh, really, I mean, you could use sim links, but uh, you should always be using absolute paths. Don't use shortcuts like tilde for home or anything like that. Don't use relative paths. Uh, always be absolute pathing. So I'm going to come down here, and MPD Music is going to be sourced from, in my case, users, my username, code, Vitaman, music. We need some other files here. We need a playlist directory, and we need a database directory, so let's make those. Uh, in Vitaman, alongside music. Playlists. Duh. Database. 
Alright, so it's going to be the same path. Oh gosh. Except playlists. None. Database. Write that. The next container that we're going to launch is called SEMA, which we really don't actually need in this in this example. Uh, what SEMA does is it can automatically queue up from other services, Last.fm, uh, or uh, my mind blanks on some of the other services that it can hook up to, but it can hook up to all kinds of different services, and you, it can automatically queue that in the in the IceCast system. Now, it's not directly the IceCast system, actually. IceCast is going to host the... Uh, it's going to manage the stream and host the endpoint. MPD is Music Player Daemon. This is the thing that's going to take the music and provide a mount point to IceCast. It's going to actually provide the sound. YMPD is uh, an interface for MPD. So we'll use YMPD to cue the music, tell MPD to get started, go. Uh, the Docker Compose file demons, uh, defines our networks music stack, it's using a bridge driver, we can talk everything locally with it. So now that we have that, let's see, alright, so now we can use Docker Compose, first of all let's confirm that we don't have anything running locally, not yet, now we can use Docker Compose up and then detach all the containers from here. Alright, so now, in my case, I had some, uh, some old versions in my Docker images, so uh, it's telling me that they were recreated. Uh, Docker Music Stack Icecast one didn't change, but the other three did. Uh, so, your output may, may vary. We do a Docker PS, we can see all of the containers that are running and SEMA didn't actually start this time. That's fine. I'm not actually worried about it. Uh, just because I happen to know that uh, it's not critical to the function of these things, it's a nice to have. We can play with, uh, with service queuing for uh, external audio services if we want to later. Um, but we can see that YMPD started, and it's found 8080 to local 8080. MPD started, and it's 6600 to 6600. And IceCast started at 8000 to 8000. Now, notice those are all localhost, right? So, localhost 8000. Oops, 8000. Boom, Icecast, it's live. If we go to 8080, this is YMPD, it's live. Uh, however, MPD I don't think actually has an interface, so this doesn't do anything. Um, it serves a service, it doesn't serve a web service, so we can't actually hit it with a web browser in this case. Uh, let's see here. If I did my pads correctly, if I pull up localhost at 8080, if I get to the YMPD page here, let's see. There we go. Uh, if I go to browse, sweet, I see my music. Here's the three files that I pulled down from rinseandrepeatradio.com. If you click them, it'll queue it. So I'll click one. We see it's, it's been added right there. We see this, it's been added, awesome. This one's been added. Let's see what we got. Oh, that's not it, hold on. Uh-oh. Where's that music coming from? That's not me. Oh wait, it is me. <laughs> <laughs> So, all right. Now, one, one non-intuitive thing about this is, uh, this is this is for station management, right? So what I did was I went to browse database. Uh, the database was volume mounted to my code vitamin music directory, where those three MP3s were. I saw them in the browse database. I clicked them to cue them, right? Now, if I hit play, we see the track is running. But we don't hear any sound. That's because, once again, this is just the management environment. 
let's pull up a new window to localhost 8000. Here we can confirm that the mount point provided by MT MPD, which was, uh, which was populated with content by YMPD, has been mounted. So we can see the screen name here. This is the default screen name that Vitamin provided, Docker MPD Radio. Uh, we didn't really provide any other data. Um, by default, it looks for 128K bitrate uh, MP3s. And, and yeah. With the administration section, we can uh, look at who's listening. Uh, we can get listener count. We can get stats on our listeners. We can manage other things about the station. Uh, the default credentials are built into the icecast.xml file, which is alongside the Docker file in the icecast directory from the Vitaman repo. So if I go to administration, it's going to ask me for a username, it's admin, and hack me. <laughs> so we're in the admin section. Uh, we can see the global server stats. Uh, client connection says nine. That's uh, various services that are working inside uh, of icecast to prove prove that it's available. Uh, that's not actually nine clients. Um, yeah, we got a host. The host name is Icecast. Um, we're using all default values here. Again, definable in icecast.xml. Uh, so the host is Icecast, the location is Earth. We're using 242. Uh, we started it just now. A little bit further down, we can see the mount point. This is, mount points are how Icecast gets source audio and uh, this is how you can do things like uh, for example uh, internet internet radio stations around have jukeboxes that play music on a playlist but some stations have live DJs that play right uh, I happen to play on a station called jungletrain.net jungletrain has a jukebox that just plays a, a, a random selection from a directory of a bunch of music on a server and when a live DJ connects the, well, we're using Shoutcast V2 in our case, uh, it's very similar to Icecast, uh, but Shoutcast swaps out the mount point live without disconnecting the clients, and that's how you can hear a live DJ. When the live DJ disconnects, the default mount point comes back into action. Uh, you can do this all without disconnecting your clients if you configure it correctly. It's tricky, uh, but it is possible. Now, if we go to our mount point list again, we can see these icons over here, M3U, XSPF, VCLT. You can, uh, these are all different playlists for tuning into your station. Uh, I like to use the M3U, and I like to play it with VLC. Uh, VLC, VLC, where are you, VLC? Oh, there we go. And here's the song. This is one of the songs that, uh, that I wrote a while back. And if we come back to YMPD, we can see what track it is and uh, how far along it is. We can also notice a delay. Turn this up a little bit. Things are happening, right? If I fast forward. Now we just jump forward, right? There's a delay between when this is broadcasting and when your client hears the audio, right? Uh, even more so when you're broadcasting across the world. Yeah, so there, we've got, a, we've got four containers, uh, well, three in, in this case, that are all working together to provide a, an IceCast stream using Docker Compose to manage our containers. Oh, here's, a, here's another fun thing. If we come into VLC, I want to make sure that my client is configured to repeat all and that I've only got one source in my playlist, the MPD radio, right? So let's, so let's say we've got... So here's my one, my one item in the playlist is pointing to my local host, uh, my local shoutcast system. Now, if I, how do I want to go about this? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So if I stop the stream, give it a second, 
boom. VLC can no longer connect to the stream because I stopped it, right? There's no mount point presented through IceCast, so IceCast has nothing to give to the client. It cuts off the clients, right? Now, if I configured this correctly, VLC will sit here looping on my one item in the playlist trying to get it to play. If I did this correctly, I ought to be able to start up again and my client automatically reconnected because I configured it to repeat the playlist. We're, list we're live on the stream again. Now, now, let's do something mischievous. All right, so what does this all have to do with Kubernetes? Um, right now, what we're seeing is a bunch of containers that work together to provide a service, right? Uh, as we were talking about earlier, Docker, Compose, Fleet, Swarm, whatever, uh, when something goes wrong, you either need to go log into the container, do something, or redeploy the thing, or, or whatever, right? It's gonna take, generally, either hands-on to fix it, or automation, that you have to build to make sure that your service stays up, right? So we've got the service, it's running. Now let's simulate a failure in the set of containers. I'm gonna exec into my IceCast container and basically kill pit one. So let's see what our IceCast container is. Uh, IceCast, docker run, Bash. Oops. What have I done? Oh, great. Thank you. Oh, my container doesn't have Bash built in, but it does have shell. So I'll just shell in. Uh, host name. I'm inside the container, right? Uh, hasn't been up for very long. Here's my running processes. Let's kill all IceCast. Container exits, music stops, right? Docker PS. I've only got two containers running now. As I was saying earlier, if a service fails with Docker Compose or Swarm or whatever, and you don't have scripting automation built around managing the service, your service is down. This is the importance of Kubernetes. This is what Kubernetes is built to, well, one of the things that Kubernetes can help with, uh, and it's one of the more popular reasons that people deploy this type of system, right? Uh, that's basically the Docker lab that I had planned here. So uh, if you're running this stuff on your local machines, don't forget to clean up. Uh, we can do that with Docker Compose easily. If we're in the, the right directory, we can Docker Compose stop. Uh, or stop. Docker Compose knows how to read the local Docker Compose YML file, uh, so that's how it knows what containers to stop uh, in the current directory. Yeah. Docker PS, we're all clean. All right. That was the Docker Lab that, uh, that illustrated a few really important things about containers that we need to understand as we move into a uh, scripted environment, an uh, infrastructure as code environment like Kubernetes. Um, at this point, it is about 10 to 11, and I think that's a good time to take a break. We can maybe take 10. Meet back at 11 o'clock, and we can continue with the actual Kubernetes zine. Yeah. Sound good? Cool. Two, however, please follow along. Uh, that way we can uh, get some actual hands-on managing of a, of a mini cluster here. So. But the, the first lab that you went through, it's not, the Kubernetes lab isn't dependent on it? Correct, it is not. I've got everything completely separate. Um, I've pre-generated all of the manifests so that we can just grab them and run them. We can look at it. We can talk about it if you want to, but uh, we don't have to write it uh, based on any of the old stuff. Uh, we could, if you guys wanted to. Uh, we can completely rebuild everything from scratch, uh, but it'll take a little bit longer. Uh, it's, I suppose it's really up to you guys. I'm happy to take that path if, if you guys uh, want to.
the lab that I have is all pre-rolled just to make it easy though. So maybe we can start there and uh, come up with an example maybe after we're done here and then we can talk about how to build a manifest from scratch. If that's cool. All right. Alright, so we just finished the Docker lab. <clears throat> Alright, so there's an awful lot of cool stuff behind Kubernetes that we're, prob that we're not going to go over. Um, pretty much everything from the system design section of the slide deck was taken straight from kubernetes.io. Uh, if you guys are interested, go check it out. Um, much like Docker, you interact with everything over the API, which means that the API reference is invaluable. Uh, we're gonna, we'll talk about this more later, we're gonna use a, a client called kubectl, uh, kubectl, to interact with the cluster, but all it's doing is issuing API calls, right? You wanna make your own client, the reference is out there, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, yeah, so in its most basic form, a Kubernetes cluster consists of two types of resources. We've got masters and workers, or nodes, whatever you want to call them. Uh, this is one of those images from Kubernetes I.O. Uh, the light blue area here represents your cluster. This is all of the things uh, that you're going to be running happen inside of here. Um, that happens to be nodes, in this case, the white, uh, whatever these are, hexagons. Uh, the white hexagons represent your nodes, the little blue boxes down here are the kublets, and the white space in each node are the, represent the resources that each node has to support your workload. The master sits here in the middle, making all the calls, coordinating all the nodes, uh, all the commands, all the everythings. Um, we'll get to the components here in just a minute, what, what makes up each of these pieces. Uh, so yeah, just as, as we were talking about, masters are responsible for managing the cluster. They coordinate all activities in the cluster. Um, that includes scheduling, maintaining a uh, desired state, scaling, rolling out updates, all of that stuff. It's also where the API server runs. Uh, nodes or workers each run the kubelet, which is just the agent for managing the node and it co communicates with the master. And each node runs a container manager like Docker, or uh, the core OS version right now is called Rocket RKT. Um, it more or less does uh, accomplishes the same job with a slightly different design principle behind it. But otherwise, it's, uh, it's really close to a drop-in replacement. In our Minikube example that we're going to do in lab one, all the components run on the same master. All the components are the kubelet, the API server, the proxy, the controller manager, etcd, uh, what I call the key value store, and the scheduler. All of these run on the same node in, a kube, in the minikube environment. This is important uh, when we get to the end of the class, we'll talk about productionization. The um, really product, uh, production environments ought to have uh, these services split out so that they are redundant and resilient. right? Uh, we can talk about more about that later. When you want to deploy something into Kubernetes, you apply a configuration script. The configuration script de describes the resource. Uh, resources, objects, I use the language interchangeably. The configuration scripts are written in YAML, just like the, the Docker Compose file. Um, when you deploy the object, uh, you notify the master that it needs to schedule a resource on a node. And uh, to do that, you interface with the system through the API using kubectl or writing your own client, whatever it is. These objects that you deploy are persistent entities in the Kubernetes system. They exist until you tell them not to. Uh, Kubernetes reads these entities, 
uh, and it tries to, it, it figures out uh, what your desired state of the cluster is. The resources themselves, they describe things like what containers are running, you know, which apps per container are running, and on which nodes if you want to define that. Uh, they define the resources available to those applications if you need a, right, like if you want a volume mount like what we did in the Docker lab, if you need uh, any number of resources, you define that in the, in the YAML file. And the policies around how the applications behave, such as what happens if something dies, do I need to restart it immediately or wait, or uh, how do I upgrade, what do I mean by fault tolerance, how many replicas do I need, things like that. Now this is important. The Kubernetes object is a record of intent. What you're saying is, here's what I want my cluster to do, cluster figure out how to do what I told you I want it to look like. And once you deploy that, Kubernetes job is to sit there and loop on your configs until it's true. If it's not true, then it'll sit there trying to make it true until you tell it not to. Okay. Uh, if, if your pod gets into that state, that's called a crash loop back off, um, it works like a lot of other queuing systems where I want a thing, it didn't work, it crashed, I still want the thing, oh it crashed again in, in very quick succession. Uh, for each failure, it's going to wait a longer amount of time before it tries it again, but it will try, just it'll wait, hopefully such that dependent resources or whatever are available sometime in the future. Uh, this is a fundamental difference in how we think about provisioning applications. I also call this desired state. So, for every object, you have two fields. You've got the spec and the status. The spec pretty much defines all the interesting stuff, what you want it to look like, what resources you want to attach to it, what ports you want to bind, stuff like that. And the status is what's, what state it's actually in. Is it provisioned? Is it waiting? Is it running? Is it whatever? Crash loop back up. And uh, like I said, the control plane is another word for the master. It actively manages an object's actual state to match the desired state that you supply. Specs are defined in YAML. Uh, required fields for every spec include the API version, the kind, if it's a service, a deployment, a pod, whatever, uh, and a metadata, at least the name, which is defined in the metadata field. Uh, the rest of the spec depends on what you're building. Here's an example spec. We've got API version, we're using apps v1 beta 1. This example happens to be a deployment, where a deployment is sort of a collection of pods. Uh, the name of this deployment is nginx deployment. Here's the spec. This is, this is everything, this defines everything that we want out of our deployment. Uh, replicas, three, that means we want three copies of this defined pod. Uh, we're going to define some metadata here, we're going to apply a label. The label is, uh, the label names are actually arbitrary, you can make them whatever you want. We'll talk more about labels later. In this case, we've got a label for app equals nginx. And then uh, for the for the label app equals nginx, here's the spec of the containers. We've got the name, arbitrary name, nginx, the image, this is pulling nginx 179 from Docker Hub, and what port uh, should be exposed. Now this one's tricky because the container port in a spec doesn't actually bind anything. What it does is it tells Kubernetes uh, to expect that it could be bound. Um, whether or not it does that depends on your configuration, depends on your infrastructure. Uh, the user guide on kubernetes.io uh, has a list of all of the, the resource types, but some of the most common resource types that, that I had to deal with are config maps, deployments, events, namespaces, nodes, pods, replica sets, and services. There are tens of resource types. There's lots of different ways to do this. Um, for example, uh, just, to, just to give you an example of some things that are out there, uh, if you have a Kubernetes installation in AWS and you want to use an EBS-backed volume, uh, one type of resource is a persistent volume. You define your persistent volume, you tell it how to, how to provision that, AWS EBS, and then you create what's called a persistent volume claim, 
the, the persistent volume claim or PVC is what you attach to your to your uh, to your pod, uh, such that Kubernetes can deterministically attach uh, an existing EBS volume. That's one example. There are many types of resource uh, that we can use to accomplish our workload. Now, for each resource, uh, they they have limit limited scope, and I call this the collision domain. Uh, for each resource, you have names, namespaces, labels and selectors, and annotations. We'll go through those now. Names are spatially unique, that is, uh, within a namespace. And we'll talk about that next. Uh, max of 253 characters, uh, can use lowercase alphanumeric, dashes, and periods. That's it. No other characters in the name of a pod. UID is generated by Kubernetes, and uh, they are distinct, and they are spatially and temporally unique. So, within a namespace, over time. Namespaces are, you can think of them as m multiple virtual clusters backed by the same actual cluster. Um, in general, you really won't need to use these until your uh, development team or application or whatever starts to grow uh, from the Kubernetes I.O. site. If you have less than 10 users, you probably don't need namespaces at all. Um, it's just a, it's, it's a way to provide uh, sort of horizontally scaled clusters on demand. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not for everyone. Generally, you don't need them. What if you're testing multiple versions of the same software? So we'll actually talk about that in a minute. Uh, there, are, there are more effective ways to organize and sort your versions and uh, um, e you know one way to do this might be dev QA prod if you wanted you don't you don't have to it's one way to solve the problem but it's a bit more overhead than it needs to be which is why they recommend not <coughs> um, for example uh, I'll riff on that a little bit more. Um, there's a concept of federation, which uh, namespaces are pretty handy for. Uh, if you think of the classic use case of a multi-tenant uh, cloud environment, right? Like what? It, like if you're a reseller, right, and you're running a Kubernetes cluster, then each of your clients might get a namespace, for example, right? Uh, that's sort of the level that we're talking about. Okay. You don't you really don't need to do that for most uh, single company use cases. Uh, it limits it limits uh, network connectivity, DNS, all of that. So by default, there are two namespaces. One is called default. That's where objects with no other namespace get deployed into. Uh, and then there's the kube system namespace. This is where uh, things created by Kubernetes system get deployed. This is where things like kubeDNS would live. Or, uh, or if you have, if you have uh, we'll talk about this more in a little bit, uh, if you have like a daemon set that runs on every node uh, to perform, let's say, metrics gathering or confirming that your node is up, this is, this is the namespace that those types of services will run in. Things that are, are critical to administering your cluster. Uh, any workspace, workload stuff either goes in default or you can create a, a new namespace for your applications if you want. Um, honestly, in, in our production environment, we're going back to default. Uh, we kind of went buck wild with namespaces and we're paying the price and I don't like it. Go back to default. Uh, start there if you absolutely need uh, more, more uh, like scaling of your cluster than think about another namespace. Uh, Another important note for our purposes, with Minikube, the kube DNS pod is enabled by default in the kube system namespace. That means that any service that we spin up has a cluster.local address that we can refer to. Um, they're still working out the bugs with this. It doesn't work 100% in every case. I found a lot of problems with, uh, with our Minikube example, uh, for example. We ought to be able to say, icecast.default.service.cluster.local and know how to talk to it. Um, but I found some issues with our labs there 
So you'll see uh, a little bit later that I've changed all the names to localhost port because all pods, all containers within a pod, uh, essentially bind on the same address. So if you talk to localhost some port, you're talking to, the, to your neighbor containers within the same pod. Uh, and not everything requires a namespace. For example, nodes and persistent volumes, as I mentioned earlier, don't have namespaces. They are globally available. Labels and selectors are effectively key value pairs that you attach to objects, mostly, uh, purely for the purpose of identification. Uh, because they're used for identification, they are relevant to users, but labels and selectors do not directly imply semantics to the core system. That is, you can use them to address a thing, but you shouldn't use a label, or you can't use a label or a selector to, for example, dynamically uh, apply an SSL certificate to a web endpoint or, um, or anything like that. We use annotations to imply these semantic content. Uh, we can use these to organize and, and select subsets of objects. Keys must be unique, um, but they do not provide uniqueness of an object. Uh, you can, we'll, we'll see some examples of this here in a minute. Uh, another key point is that the data is mostly small and unstructured for labels and selectors. For example, release stable or environment dev in this case environment QA, environment fraud, whatever. Tier, front end, tier, back end. Um, these are all key value pairs, you know, separated by the commas here. Uh, you can apply multiple labels to a single object. Um, and uh, the keys and values themselves are otherwise arbitrary as long as your keys are unique. For example, you can, you can query this stuff. If you're doing it based on URL, like get strings, we can use label selector equals something, right? If you have, if you have, uh, let's say, environment, and you want to select all pods that are in production with a query string, you can you can use this pattern here. Or if you want to do multiple patterns, you can do that uh, just with just by separating the, the requirements. This is called equality based uh, selecting or requirements. Uh, my key equals this thing. I want exactly this value for this key, right? Set-based requirements are also possible where you can say, I want all values that match this, uh, or rather, I want all things that have this value in them, right, as part of the set. So for example, environment is in the production definition, whatever that is, or, the, or front end is in my tier definition, whatever that is. Um, uh, URL query strings are a little bit harder to, to read unless, unless you're familiar with a bunch of the web programming stuff. So here's another example. If we want to use kubectl to get all of our pods that match a label of environment equals production and tier equals front end, this is what that uh, equality based requirement kind of looks like. Um, same idea for set based. We can say I want uh, all of the pods where environment is in production, or all of my tiers are in front end, or whatever, whatever your key values are. Annotations, uh, uh, separate from labels and selectors, they are again key value maps uh, that again attach arbitrary non-identifying metadata to objects. Um, tools and libraries can retrieve the metadata to do cool things. If you're using the AWS cloud provider, for example, you can use an annotation to do something like I want to serve secure HTTP over this port and attach to this cert uh, in, in AWS land. Uh, as long as you have your certificate registered, uh, AWS will take your service, say, oh, I need to attach some certificates to this and, and just do it, uh, which is magical and everyone should be using it. Um, you, can use, you can use either labels or annotations to attach metadata to Kubernetes objects, but uh, Generally, annotations are are more dynamic. You've got structured or unstructured data. It can be big, uh, lots of data, lots of lots of uh, requirements, lots of context, uh, or it can be not much at all. Uh, annotations are a bit more flexible in that way, but again, they imply semantic content. Uh, 
uh, labels do not. Also, it allows characters not permitted by labels, if for some reason you need them. This is, I'm sure, not easy to see back there, but it's a. Uh, let's see, can I? No. Yes. Okay. I don't know. Um, this is an example of using an annotation to attach an internal load balancer from AWS, tell it what backend protocol to attach to, and which certificate ARM, in an AWS case, uh, to attach to the load balancer. Uh, if you're not familiar, uh, ARNs in Amazon are uh, unique identifiers for objects that exist. They've got a path um, similar to like a web path, but in this case, it's ARN colon AWS colon ACM for the certificate manager colon uh, availability zone colon the ID for the certificate in this case. All right, and finally, we will talk about liveness and readiness probes. Uh, these probes or checks are not required to run your workload. However, if you want to uh, really intelligently manage the uptime of your service, defining liveness and readiness are critical, um, particularly in a distributed application. If you've got multiple, multiple pods deployed all working together, uh, then, then you really need uh, to have these defined properly. The liveness probe knows, or rather tells Kubernetes when to restart a container. If you give it some time threshold, and the liveness probe cannot return true, then Kubernetes will restart your pod. Uh, generally involves making some kind of request to a port or a, or a file system location. Um, a real simple uh, example is get slash on 80 or whatever. As long as you get a 200 response, probe is good. If you don't, probe is bad. And if your threshold is low enough, then that will trigger Kubernetes to restart your pod. Readiness probes, however, tell the kubelet when a pod is ready to serve traffic. This is different from being alive because your web server can be up, but not connected to your database, for example. If you're not connected to your database, what good is that service to your customers, right? So you can define these separately, and uh, getting them right can be real tricky, but when, when you get it right, it really enables Kubernetes to effectively manage your, your service um, to achieve greater uptime, more reliability, all that stuff. Um, yeah. yeah. So here's a, a selection of a liveness and a readiness probe uh, within a full spec. I couldn't paste the whole thing in here. But in general, we say, here's our liveness probe. Uh, in this case, we're going to do uh, we're going to hit a TCP socket on port 80 after 10 seconds uh, of the pod being alive. Uh, and if it doesn't work, then check every 10 seconds after. Uh, this, is, this is different from the readiness probe in that the readiness probe is going to say, uh, okay, that's great. Liveness says I got a 200 response when I tried to hit port 80 on, on my pod, but the readiness probe is going to issue an HTTP GET on a path that in, in any readiness case ought to imply that all of the backing resources are available for your service to be online. In this case, I chose to, to explicitly call out a path that implies that the DB is ready, that, that your database is ready and accessible from your PHP script or whatever, right? Still going to happen over port 80. You still have an initial delay seconds, timeout, period seconds, all of that. Um, but but getting those right can be tricky. It's real important that you do to ensure greatest uptime. Uh, any questions on that stuff? Cool. All right, let's get it. Mm -hmm. Time to stand up some mini coup. Those of you following along, let's hit the wiki for module five, Kubernetes lab, part one. First thing we need to do is get our client configured. We're gonna use kubectl. 
uh, and they there are there are many ways to get this. Um, if you're on a Mac, they're they're in the brew ports. Uh, they're packaged with a few other repositories, uh, but Kubernetes provides this as a straight downloadable binary. So this curl command here, this is the whole command. Uh, it's one line. We're basically subshelling to figure out what the latest release is right here. We're going to find what Kubernetes release stable is. Uh, and then whatever that is, we're going to pull it from googleapis.com slash Kubernetes release pod. Um, this, oh, I, I suppose I should point out, this is the Mac URL. So if you're on, if you're on a Mac, you can pull Darwin. If you're not, then let's just look up kubectl download. In this first note here from Kubernetes I.O. Uh, we'll have all of the versions that we need. I happen to be on Mac OS. There's Linux and Windows clients for whatever you guys want to run. So what I'm saying, don't pull this exact one if you're not on a Mac. If you're not on a Mac, you can't pull the Darwin uh, version and expect it to work. Yeah, so if you're, if you're on Linux or Windows, go to the Kubernetes I.O. site uh, or just Google kubectl download, it'll be the first, it should be the first result, um, and grab the version that's applicable to you. Uh, they all essentially operate the same way, but for example, Linux points to bin Linux AMD64, Mac OS points to Darwin, etc. All right, so I like to do this stuff by rolling through temp. Um, so for me, or here actually, I'll, uh, I'll pull it straight from the site here. Download the latest release. Oh, you know what? I So I'm on Mac, I'm going to go ahead and curl this address. Poor little Wi-Fi. You know what, I already have it, so I'm going to stop that so you guys can continue. Anyone still downloading kubectl? Okay, we'll give that a minute. When it is done downloading, um, don't forget to change mode, user plus execute, and then move it to a place that's in your path. I like to use uh, user local bin, and I just put it uh, straight at kubectl right here. Uh, when you're done, you ought to be able to run kubectl version and get some output that looks something like this. Let me know when you two are done. Saw two hands back there. Yeah, I'm, I'm downloading two. Awesome. Okay. Let me know when you're done here then. Yeah. Awesome. I'm done too. Awesome. You guys still downloading? Anyone still downloading? You can go ahead. Cool. 
All right, so if you run kubectl version, you'll get two things of, of interest here. Client version, it'll say whatever your version is. I happen to use 164. I think that's latest. Um, this was just from like two days ago. Uh, and then the bottom line here is also interesting. The connection to the server local host 8080 was refused. Did you specify the right host report? Um, this is because the kubectl binary is going to always try to connect to the cluster. Um, by default, localhost 88. Um, if you see that, you're doing it right. <laughs> um, kubectl configuration, uh, it uses a, a file called config, uh, and that file, in, in our case, is going to be created for us by Minikoop. Uh, Mini, the, the config file that Minikoop provides is going to tell us um, what API version, where to hit it, uh, a few defining things about the connection itself. Um, it's otherwise a pretty simple thing. Uh, and last note before we move on there is that many of the kubectl commands are executed very similarly to Docker. For example, if you want to exec into a pod, you use kubectl exec-ti image name command, right? Or uh, there, there's many, many commands are very portable between kubectl and Docker. If you're interested in all the things you can do, hit that kubectl reference button right there. It'll take you to the uh, API and you can see what it does. So, mini kube. By default, it's going to put that configuration in your home directory, dot kube slash config. At the time of this writing, I'm using 0.19.1 of Minikube. Um, let's go ahead and see if that is latest. Yep, 0.19.1 is still latest as of four days ago. So let's go ahead and pull that image there. Uh, once again, the uh, links in the wiki here are for Mac OS. If you are not using Mac, you can look up Minikube latest. Go to that GitHub page, um, and uh, let's see. If you're if you're looking at this page, 0.19.1 is latest release. If you scroll down a little bit, you've got installation for Linux, Windows, whatever it is you're using. Debian. I saw an Ubuntu box over there. Uh, they're all in the app get repos. Um, and just like kubectl, we have to make sure that we have permissions to execute and that it's in our path. So I would move minikube also into user local bin uh, for now. Um, yeah. So as you guys are downloading, uh, I want to point out that... Um, I think we talked about this in a little bit, but um, I want to point out that the client and the server should always match. Um, Minikube puts out that they ought to be at least one minor revision backwards compatible. In my experience, don't mess with it. <laughs> Make them match. Uh, your life will be easier. Uh, you know, if you look at the versions of this, we're talking 0.19.1. They're not even in a 1.0 release yet. This is very much beta stuff. Uh, breaking changes happen all the time. Uh, so. The, the more in sync your client and the server are, the better time you'll have. Uh, I don't actually remember how big this binary is. You guys still downloading? Just control. Yeah. Still downloading? Okay. Minikube. Minikube, yep. When Minikube's downloaded, go ahead and uh, run. And as long as you have VirtualBox installed, we got to have VirtualBox installed in order to proceed here. Uh, when Minikube's downloaded, go ahead and run this command, minikube dash dash vm dash driver equals virtualbox, start. You'll see this kind of output, uh, and this is going to auto-generate our kubectl config file uh, and tell us how, to, how we can use kubectl to talk to our local Kubernetes cluster. While that's going, I'll, I'll talk about this bottom note here. When you run Minikube start, 
uh, in our case, we have to pass an additional uh, parameter, right? We have to tell Minikube to use VirtualBox to host um, the stuff that it does. Once that's up, well, I guess I should do it too, huh? Minikube VM driver VirtualBox start. See how it says starting VM? That's because it knows how to talk to VirtualBox. And if I go look at my VirtualBox instance, I've now got a VM called Minikube up and running. You can watch console if you want, whatever it is, through VirtualBox. Clusters up, you should be able to cat your config file at home.kubeconfig. And it should look something like this. A few interesting notes. Uh, the certificate authority is uh, self created, it lives at home directory.minikube/slash ca.crt. Um, your server address, that's an address provided by your hypervisor, in this case, uh, uh, VirtualBox. It's uh, by default uses a bridge networking model, so uh, any address that you want to hit, you should be able to hit it locally and it'll know how to route it. Um, other interesting notes here, it sets up a context by default called Minikube. The context has items cluster, user, and name, uh, and then current context is just wherever we're at currently. Um, context is important when you're dealing with multiple clusters because to talk to your cluster, you're actually using a lot of configuration behind the scenes. There's an environment, there are a bunch of environment variables that get set, you're using certificates to authenticate with the API server, stuff like that. So all that stuff gets set for us by kubectl in this case. Um, but when you have multiple clusters, you have to swap out your certs, swap out your environment variables, all this stuff. Um, I've got a couple of scripts if anybody's interested to help me manage them. Uh, I also like to do things like uh, establish an SSH port forward so that I can, you know, locally talk to things in my cluster if I want to. Um, I manage all of that with a handy little bash script. Uh, for our purposes for this lab, we don't need it, but if you're going to be running multiple clusters in the future, uh, you'll want to figure out an automated way to manage all of these things because uh, it gets really annoying really fast. Anybody still downloading? All right, gotcha. All right. Let me know when you're done then. Done? Cool. Uh, go ahead and get Minikube started. And let's make sure that uh, you get your config file. Let's make sure that when you run kubectl that you get versions for both client and server. So my, my Minikube is started. So now if I run kubectl version, now I get both client version Oh, 160, I guess. Server version 164. Okay, apparently I do need to download the new version. <laughs> uh, no, not new. While this is going, I uh, suppose I should also point out, um, given the uh, political climate around net neutrality and internet service provider bandwidths and, and things, um, the stuff we're about to do here is very bandwidth intensive. Um, I suppose you guys should, should be aware of whatever rules and regulations might apply based on your internet service provider. Um, I know that companies like Comcast are fairly aggressive about their 
bandwidth caps for certain markets, not everywhere. But uh, if you're going to be pulling down and pushing images and stuff, we're quickly talking, you know, gigs per image. Um, if you're doing an awful lot of local development, it adds up quick. So I just want to put that out there. Um, we're moving a lot of data here, so be aware. Add to that, um, the, if you get a business account with Comcast, unfortunately, it's a little bit more expensive, but that's where you can get your cap. So yep. You do need to do it. That's it's a little bit more expensive. You get lower throughput, but you don't have caps, and they don't they don't harass you nearly as much. You can buy an extra fifty. You can. Yeah. Okay. So on any plan, I pay an extra fifty for a cap. Fifty bucks. Per month. Per month. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, I get charged two hundred again. Ouch. You know, at that point, it's probably cheaper to just go get like a, uh, a server sitting out in like, you know, OVH. I pay 28 bucks a month for a Linux box that sits in a cloud in Canada. Right. So, yeah, yeah, a bit safer since it's out of the United States, actually. Uh, <laughs> we always, we always can be. recommend the limiter for, the, for their services. The mm -hmm. What's that? There's the limiter, the limiter VPS. Their oh yeah. Their blade servers are cheap. Yeah. The biggest problem that I've had is, uh, I, I host a bunch of music online, right? I'm, I'm hosting like 100 gigs of music, and uh, the disk space behind VPS is what adds up really quickly. I've been on Linode for a long time, uh, but they don't have a very dynamic storage layer. So for me, uh, I'm looking at DigitalOcean next because they have um, really well-defined APIs for managing storage. So if you guys have a lot of storage needs, uh, it's sure. very flexible. Who is? Vulture. Vulture. Yeah, I don't know Vulture. Like cool. I'll have to check them out. They have servers in like Dallas, and uh, it's pretty much closer to here. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. I'll look them up. Thanks. All right. Looks like we're good here. Let's. Well, let's do this. One six four. One six four. Awesome. User local bin. CTO. Uh, anybody still downloading Minikube uh, or setting up their config files? Awesome. We're good. Oops. I guess I'm still saying. Okay. No worries. Uh, when when you're setting up your uh, when you're done setting up your configs or uh, done starting Minikube, run kubectl version. Make sure that your versions match. And uh, take a look at your .coop slash config file uh, just to get familiar with what's in there. When that's done, we can start looking at some things. Um, you can run kubectl cluster dash info to get uh, information about your master. Um, and there's more uh, verbose output if you use the dump command. So kubectl cluster dash info. Tells me where my master's running at. Um, yeah. Let's uh, let's make sure that our kubectl versions match our, our server. Uh, does anyone's version not match? All right. Let's take a look at what we got here. What versions do you have? So we just need to update the kubectl client then. Yeah. So I pulled it straight uh, Not many good ones. The GitHub page, I So let's uh, Google kubectl download.
because that gives us a different way to identify latest. So let's just use that. See how it, it snags the yeah. latest release yeah. file there? Let's try that and see what happens. And if you want a separate window, you can run that curl command and it's the storage uh, uh, on the last text. So that's that's the version selector. Let's go ahead and run that curl again. Let's run that curl, blah blah blah, stable. Oh, so let's figure so out what stable is. is. And that should be 164. Right, so that's the version that we just have on the Well, so go ahead and uh, set the permissions, move it into, into your path, and then rerun it. The version should match. This piece of the lab here, um, apparently when I wrote it, the versions were slightly different. So what I chose to do was I reverted, I reverted kubectl to match the new cluster. So I went back to 160. Um, in general, it's it's totally fine to go with latest if that's what you want. Uh, so uh, the only the only important thing here is that the client and the server match. How's that looking? That's, that's the one you're running, so maybe you can link user with group CTL to use a little bit or something. I like to use user with a little bit, but I'm just going to run that to you. I mean, you can move user with group CTL to use a little bit group CTL. It or or move the new binary you just downloaded and use a bit which is whichever way is better for me. All right. So we were talking about context earlier. Uh, to identify the cluster that you're in, that you're that you're currently configured to talk to, you can use kubectl space config space get dash contexts plural. And uh, that will list all the clusters that your client knows how to talk to, and uh, it'll have an identifier for what you're currently connected to. Then you can run a kubectl get no, short for nodes. There's a bunch of abbreviations in here that we can talk about later. Um, no is short for the resource type nodes. If you click on this resource type link, you'll get a list of the resource types and uh, what their abbreviations are. You ought to see something like minikube ready for some time at whatever version. Uh, looks like we'll be at 164 here. And there we are, 164. Uh, now mine says it's been up for five days because that was the last time I managed stuff. 
To get a little bit more information about the output, you can use the dash O for output. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways you can do this. Wide just gives you a slightly more information. Move CTL, get no out wide. This way we get external IP, OS image, kernel version, blah. Um, I understand in future versions of kubectl they're going to make some of this data uh, default output. So, but the usage of the tool might change a little bit, but otherwise it's all the same information. Um, when when we stood up Minikube, like I said, it creates it creates a, a host bridge network um, that routes to your node. You can see what that router is with Minikube IP. We can use the Minikube binary to otherwise to extract. Uh, network information for the thing that it built. You can also use Minikube to list the services that it knows about. Minikube service list. In this case, like we said earlier, we've got a few default services that get deployed. In Kube system, we have Kube DNS and Kubernetes dashboard. In the default namespace, uh, we've got the Kubernetes service itself, the Kubelet. Um, we can see what services have been exposed by their URL. The Kubernetes service and the kubeDNS uh, service have not been exposed. The Kubernetes dashboard service, however, by default is exposed at this address at 30,000, at our master at port 30,000. Now, one cool trick with Minikube is that we can Minikube service and then the name of the service, and it'll automatically launch that thing in our browser. So in this case, we want Kubernetes-dashboard. Now, Minikube is going to fail. What? <laughs> uh -oh. Excellent. Kubernetes-dashboard. Oh, OK. There we go. Uh, so sorry, by default, when you run Minikube, it's running against your default namespace. If you want to define a different namespace, like in our case, uh, kube-system, you can define your namespace with dash n. That also applies to kubectl. So I ran minikube-n kube-system service, name of the service, which is Kubernetes dashboard, and that opened up my default browser, pointed at the master address at port 30,000, and now we see the Kubernetes dashboard. Uh, your pod list will probably be blank. I pulled the busy box image because it's a tiny way of, of troubleshooting my environment. Uh, with Minikube, I can do things like exec ns lookup a thing to make sure that networking works, for example, or whatever. Um, it's, it's just a handy troubleshooting tool. From the interface here, we can investigate our namespaces. Um, we can look at our nodes, which right now, right, we only have one, it's a single node cluster. We talked about persistent volumes, but we don't have any defined. We did not talk about storage classes, but there is one defined by default, which is called standard. And in the Minikube case, I believe that just mounts a local path and starts to consume data on your local disk and passes it through to your, to your pods. Um, there's all kinds of good stuff in the Kubernetes dashboard here. Uh, you guys can go ahead and play around with that at your leisure. But I'm going to go ahead and move on here. Um, last thing to note is that, yeah, if we look at VirtualBox, we can see our we can see our cluster running uh, with all of its VirtualBox attributes. We can see what networks it's connected to down here. This is how the uh, host, uh, how the host-based uh, bridge network works, um, and we can see all of the things that that it has. So, all right. Is everyone's mini kube started? Kube CTL up to date and connectable. Dashboard. All right, let's take a look at what's going on there. Oh, that's the dashboard. This is the dashboard. Yeah, there you go. You, you just don't have any additional things for vision, but yeah, there's your default namespaces. You pop up all through the system. Oh, there's your one node that's made. Yeah. yeah. That is the dashboard.
Everyone have access to the dashboard? Cool. All right, so just to review, our cluster is comprised of a single node where all seven components are running. Um, and, uh, and also, since this one single node also represents our worker, this is where all of our workload is going to be deployed into. It's all happening on the same node. So let's deploy our first, our first uh, image. This is going to work an awful lot like, like a Docker run thing might work. Uh, and we'll get into more advanced configurations here in a minute. So with kubectl, we can launch an image directly with this command up here. Run, give it a name, dash dash image, a path to an image, a tag, and a port to bind to. kubectl, run, give it a name, whatever, no, no, image. Whatever uh, this image is, GCRIO, blah blah blah. This is, um, this is, oops, oh gosh, what did I This GCRIO path to the Echo server is Google's Hello World, basically. Image equals that, and then I'm going to dash dash port to 88. All right, so I got a deployment now called Donk Donk, and it's running an image from Google, and it's bound to a port. Let's see, what do I do next? All right, so if we kubectl get po, short for pods, now we see that we have a pod running. And you know what? I'm actually going to delete my pod busy box so that I don't clutter this stuff up. Now, if we get pods, well, we'll get to this in a minute. My busy box pod is terminating. Give a second. Seven seconds. Oh yeah. So uh, when you're getting resources through kubectl, you can pass the dash w flag for watch, and that will it's like a follow of a log file or something. Uh, maybe it's already done. Maybe not. Well, it's terminating. It doesn't matter. The point here is we have a pod now with a name. Now, what we did was we pulled an image and we ran it, right? But if we get our deployments, we see that we have a deployment called Donk Doc. How did that happen? Um, the image itself, you don't just run an image. You don't just run a container in Kubernetes. You have to have some kind of thing that controls how it works. So by default, when we say run an image, Kubernetes went and built a very default deployment for us. If we describe the resource deployment slash donk donk, in this case, we'll see a little bit about what it did for us uh, and when it did. So by default, it applied a label, run equals the name of the deployment that I gave it. It's got an annotation, uh, doesn't really mean anything to us in this case, but it's also applied a selector. So if I wanted to grab things in kubectl that matched a label or a selector, I could provide dash l run equals blah, and it'll grab it. Uh, by default, we wanted by default it's going to set up one replica. When we get the when we describe the deployment, we see that the replica set is we want one. It did one. In total, there is one, and there is one available. In other words. Our deployment is successful, it's live, it's online, it's doing its thing. Uh, we have zero unavailable. Uh, it applied a few other things about how this thing works, uh, but let's go ahead and make it work. Uh, Unikube service list. We see that nothing is, is in there because we have not defined a way to expose it. So we launched the image. We told it to use the port 8080, but that's from inside the container, right? So we have to tell Kubernetes to say, here's the container port. Put it on a port that I can talk to. And we do that with, well, in our case, we're going to use Minikub to, ah, sorry, I misspoke. We're going to use kubectl to expose, eh, expose the service 
with a deployment ID of whatever it is. Uh, in my case, donk donk, deploy, uh, and we're going to expose it with a type node port. Capitalization is important here, capital N, capital P. So I have a service, it's called donk donk. The container, expo uh, the container is serving on 8080, but it wasn't exposed. So we ran kubectl to expose that container uh, using a node port. Now if I minikube service list, we see an additional service here. Uh, we didn't define a namespace, so my deployment got deployed into the default namespace. Now that we have a URL exposed, we can minikube service that service name. No, no. This is what the echo server does. All it, it just it prints out the things that it was requested. Right? So we asked for basically just the root path. We got it from this uh, internal Docker address, um, various headers and thingies about the request, but there was no body in the request because we didn't actually ask for anything there. But the point is the echo server works by the exposed port that hits the container that we ran immediately from gcr.io with kubectl. Can everyone see their echo server? No. Cool. I'm just going to expose, unexpose So, okay, so this is the pod name that you're trying to expose, but we want to expose the deployment name. The deployment name is hello dash mini. Oh. If, you, if you were following the, this yeah. guy, yes. So let's do that minus the pod ID stuff. Hello dash mini. There you go. Now mini group service list. There you go. So now you can mini group service uh, hello dash mini group and see the echo server. Boom. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Everyone else working out okay? Oh, cool. Thank you for stopping by. Uh, all of the rest of the labs are in there. Uh, so the interesting stuff comes in Kubernetes Lab 2. That's where we, uh, I have a bunch of pre-constructed um, images that I put up on my Docker Hub. So yeah. as long as you're logged in, you'll be able to deploy the, the Kate's manifests. Okay. And uh, you can follow along uh, with the lab kind of loading. I'll get you that Bitcoin invoice today. Oh, thanks. Everyone else got their Echo server running? Awesome. You can use the minikoop service command to do all kinds of things. You can list your URL. Uh, you can curl. You can do the same thing we just did through the web browser on the CLI if you want to, whatever. So we can also uh, we can also directly manage our pods, kubectl get pod, um, and that lists the pod that was created by the deployment. Uh, let's see, are we done here? I think so. Well, almost. If we describe our pod, po slash, and then the name of the pod, we can get a bunch of information and logs about what happened most recently. We get the name of the pod, the namespace it's in. Uh, the node that it's been scheduled to, we only have one node, so it's only going to go to one place, but in a production environment, you should have multiple nodes, which means that uh, if you need to figure out what node it's in, describe your resource, it'll tell you. Bunch of annotations, uh, what IP, a bunch of container information. Uh, I'm going to skip down here to the log section, uh, because <laughs> troubleshooting is... The way we think about troubleshooting with a well-designed 12-factor app is a little bit different, right? All of the logs should be considered event streams. Um, they don't get buffered to a log file on disk or anything like that. So uh, when we describe our pod, we get the most recent logs here. Uh, now this is, in, in our case, Minikoop was able to successfully schedule everything. Um, that means that the service that we asked for was live. 
uh, that the source that we're pulling the image from was good and we pulled it correctly, uh, and that we scheduled and that everything else happened properly. So the logs that we see here are, are all positive, right? We successfully assigned the pod to the node. Um, we pulled the container properly from this location. Uh, in my case, I already had it present on the machine, so it actually skipped pulling it. Um, and then right here, we started the container with ID blah. That means that our pod started properly. Uh, if it didn't, you would describe your pod and you would see some log file about why that didn't happen. Um, there are other ways to investigate as well. If we kubectl get events with no namespace, we'll get, uh, we'll get the Kubernetes system, the master events, in the default namespace. Um, in this case, uh, these are all OK logs. They're a little bit hard to read because of the resolution here. But um, for example, some, some important things to see here at the bottom. Node minikube status is now node has sufficient disk. That's good. Node has sufficient memory. That's good. Node has no disk pressure. We're all good. Uh, this last line is uh, from me uh, rebooting things, doing things. Um, on the left side there, you get two ages. If you scroll up, you can see which what they are. We have last scene is the first column. First scene is the second column. But you'll notice that, um, or you may notice, yeah, here we go. You'll notice that, uh, and I don't know why they do this. James, if you have any idea, I'd love to hear it. Uh, these aren't in chronological order. I really don't understand why. But um, we have 29 minutes, 8 minutes, nine minutes. We just, we bounced around a little bit, right? In order to, uh, in order to sort the output here, we can provide... It's sorting by asking where by what. Really? No. No, you're right, actually, you're right. No, nope, it's not even ASCII order. Yep. ASCII, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know why they do that, but, um, let's see, kubectl sort Events. I forget what the string is, so I gotta look it up. Uh, you have to pass this uh, this JSON sorter thingy. I forget what it is. Oh, here it is. Get events. Sort by dot last timestamp. For example. Oops. So that gets the events and sorts it by last. So now we have ten, and then in reverse order up to 31 minutes ago. So, just a note on debugging with get events. More slower, yeah. so in terms of events on the local service, uh, are you just, the best practice, you just send them to systolic servers, so there's no persistent data on the container? I would recommend so, yes. Yeah, there should, uh, your containers are ephemeral, right? They should come and go, uh, and your app should be persistent, and the logs should be intact uh, downstream, right? Uh, so yeah, by default, uh, there's a note in, in the 12 factor discussion about uh, always logging to standard out. Docker does this by default, so uh, as long as you have your syslog destinations configured properly, uh, you will have an aggregation or analysis engine behind it, something like that. And your kubectl, which is managing the DNS for the containers, is that do you use an upstream DNS for kubectl, or do you configure the containers? So kubectl itself does not manage DNS. In our case, we're using minikube. Minikube, by default, launches a daemon set called kube-dns. That's for the inside cluster DNS stuff. That's the uh, When you launch something inside of Kubernetes, it's going to automatically, uh, if it can, assign the resolver for the container to the address of kubedns. So. But then kubedns, can you point that to some other upstream server, I'm assuming? Yeah, yeah. You can, you can set your upstream, you can set your root resolvers from there. From within kubectl, within the kube. Yes, if you want to configure kubedns, you can do that from uh, not in not inside minikube because it comes with a default configuration. You have to get into the kubedns config and change it there. Okay. Uh, or yeah, like 
if, if in a production environment, you don't get this for free, right? You have to tell KubeDNS to be launched as a daemon set or as a whatever type service you want. Um, that's where you would manage your upstream. Mm -hmm. Those default sort of the Kube system services are all in the Kubernetes GitHub repo under like add-ons, cluster add-ons or something like that. Yep. Oh, is that what it's supposed to be? There's like default manifest in there and there's Kube control apply given the add-on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, there's tons of add-ons too. You, there's all kinds of cool stuff in there. Um, yeah, definitely check it out. All right, we checked out our deployment. Um, there's a few other resource types that we can just take a look at real quick. Kube CTL get RS is short for uh, replica sets. Uh, we can see that we've got one replica set def uh, defined by default as we saw when we described our deployment earlier. Um, our replication set says we want one, we have one, and it's ready. The replication set is, is sorted. We've got everything that we asked for there. Um, while this pod is running, I'll show you something fancy here. Uh, you know what, I'm gonna, okay. So, let's demonstrate some of the coolness behind the system. We have a replica set, it says we want one, we have one, the replica set is addressed. But, if we delete a pod, underneath the replica set, what's gonna happen? We look at our pod, we're terminating it, Kubernetes automatically reprovisioned a pod with the same definition uh, of the previous because that was part of the deployment, right? So here's the one, this is the old pod, dash HDJDN. It's terminating. I didn't have to do anything. Kubernetes says, uh oh, my replication controller, my replication set says I should have one, but the only one I have is being terminated. Spin it up again. We got one pod already running in place of the pod that we deleted. This is the basis of the self-healing nature of the system. Wait a little bit longer, the terminated pod is no longer listed, the new pod is up and running. Our replication controller is once again happy because we have one ready which matches our desired count of one. So, if we wanted to delete, uh, if we actually wanted to delete the pod and have it not come back, we'd get rid of the entire deployment. Um, in addition, the services are managed separately. So if we like, yeah, so let's get our deploy. It's called donk donk, right? So if we kubectl delete deploy slash the name, the deployment gets deleted kubectl get pod, our pod is terminating because the replication controller effectively says we want zero now and we have one, let's apply the config, right? If we wait long enough, gone. Now we exposed a service, right? So let's see if it's still there. It is. So if we kubectl get svc, short for service, we see that darmthalk is still exposed. So we also have to delete our service. Okay. Now, Minikube doesn't have a service to map to, and so it's not listed. This cleans our lab one. Uh, yep, and those are the last steps there. Uh, was everyone able to follow along there? And we're all cleaned up. We don't have any lingering pods or services. Awesome. Thus concludes lab one. How are we doing? Still with me? <laughs> All right. Now we'll move on to lab two with the uh, ice cast. Doggos. <laughs> All right. So if you're following along earlier, you've already cloned this repo, so no big deal. Um, I just want to run through what the repo is real quick. Uh, this one. So if you go to github.com slash minus 64, uh, you can click the Cadence Music Stack repo, and uh, this is what you should be seeing. Slide decks here, 
the wikis here. Um, all of the Docker files that I created uh, are very much based off of Vitaman's work. Uh, I did a few version bumps and uh, and I, I prepped a couple of the configuration files for deployment in this type of system. So like for example, we can go to Icecast, we can see the Docker file here. Um, it's all very similar to what Vitaman did. Um, so thanks to his awesome work there. This is what the configuration file for Icecast looks like. For the Kate's music stack, I modified a few things so that we can see that the changes occurred. I changed the location to Deep Base Station 9. I've got my admin email in here. Um, didn't really update the passwords. They're all default. Uh, and let's see. I think that's it for Icecast. Now, when Icecast runs, the rest of these services want to talk to it. So, for example, for MPD, I had to update the configuration file here to... Where is it? Uh, down here at the bottom somewhere? There it is. So, when MPD kicks off the mount point to Icecast, I've updated the name, so we'll see that reflected in YMPD. Uh, and then I changed host here to localhost because once again all the containers that run in a pod uh, share the same IP space so localhost from that containers perspective is the same across uh, across all the containers in the pod just to make it easy for demonstration purposes there's a couple other modifications in here from vitamin stack uh, you can go through those at your leisure if you like here in the Cades directory this is where we'll actually take a look at the manifest that we're going to deploy uh, to make Kubernetes pull all the images, deploy all the services, uh, expose all the services, and, and keep everything running for us. Back to my notes. Alright, so we should all be cloned up. Just to give you an idea of how, how these are all built and, and pushed, um, I've got a quick little for loop in here. Uh, if you clone the stack, you can do all this and push to your own repo. Um, for container in IceCast, MPD, SEMA, and YMPD, those are the directories in the Cades music stack. Good question? Um, for each of those containers, do a Docker build with the tag, slash the container, tag it latest, and in the container directory, again, we're in Cades music stack here, and then push it to, in my case, Mars 64 container latest. If you guys have your own Docker Hub, feel free to build and push uh, on your own. Um, perhaps not here. Uh, David's poor, poor internet connection. But this is basically what it looks like. Uh, I'm building everything from Alpine 3.6, which is latest as of like two days ago. Um, I've updated my maintainer info uh, we've got environment variables for which IceCast version to get. Uh, I left that in there. That's leftovers from Vitaman's work. Uh, he does some version-specific stuff I, uh, right here. Um, APK is Alpine's package manager. It's just like an apt get, basically, or a yum or whatever. Um, now, this, this part's interesting here. Alpine, like I said earlier, is designed to be low footprint, right? It's designed to be super tiny. Uh, the default image is like five megabytes. It's, it's really tiny for, for a fully fledged operating system, right? Like busy box tiny. Um, the first thing we do is run an APK quiet update. That updates all the system libraries and, and things that it needs, kernel versions, stuff like that. Uh, then we run uh, an installation, APK quiet, don't display progress, add icecast, add is, is the install uh, verb for APK, uh, and we add icecast at a specific version. This is how we can version lock. Uh, it works well for this. Now here's the interesting part. At the very end, we remove the entire APK cache. We do this so that we can minimize the file size of the container uh, so that we can ensure that we're not propagating junk for the purpose of propagating junk, right? Um, after we do that, we copy in a silence og file, which is used by MPD between tracks if you have it configured that way. Uh, this is, again, default work from Vitaman that I just left in there. Uh, we copy our icecast.xml, which you'll see in the same directory alongside your Docker file. 
copy that into user share eyes test, which is then, I think, referenced, yeah, down here at the bottom. Uh, but before that, we make our, all of our directories that IceCast expects. We change users. This is important for security. Uh, by default, all your containers run as root, right? Same as Docker. Um, we apply some permissions. We create the directories. And then down here at the bottom, we're running the command at the very last. This is going to be our PID1, right? IceCast with a config of user share IceCast, IceCast.xml. This is how you can customize your container for your own environment. If you have different paths, uh, you want to provide your own configuration file, you want to make sure that your, the container you're deploying doesn't include nefarious software that you don't know. Go read the Docker file. If you're still not convinced, pull the Docker file and build it yourself. Nothing preventing you from doing that, and that way you absolutely know that it's clean, that it's what you want, that it's what you're asking for, right? Um, I mean, as long as you trust your repositories, that's okay. Once you're building, um, as you can see here, I already had all the layers, so it, it built really quickly for me. Uh, last was IceCast, this is MPD, then we build uh, YMPD and SEMA, and this is all just build stuff. You can see it uh, if you guys want to build your own containers. So now that our images are customized for our environment and staged to Docker Hub, we can craft our, our K8s or Kubernetes manifests uh, to control the deployment. I already did this for you guys. Uh, if you want, uh, at the end, we can customize our own manifests and, and launch them however you like. Uh, let's take a look at what these manifests look like. Um, where am I? Oh. Okay, it's music stack. Uh, I just want to make sure I have latest. Looks like I do. Uh, okay, it's... All right, here's all of our manifests, our specs in YAML format or whatever. I'll take a look at, um, we'll go through the deployment first and then we'll talk about services. The services are a little easier, but they don't make any sense without the deployment. So, oops, I guess I gotta give it the path. All right. So once again, we've got API version, kind, and metadata, uh, at least name. The API version is self-explanatory. This is a deployment, separate from a pod or a service or whatever. Um, and we've got a name, K2 Music Stack. Uh, the spec for the deployment defines one replica. Uh, in, this six, in this lab, we don't have a pod design that supports multiple replicas. Um, I didn't get around to, to making that work. Uh, with the right definition, you can totally scale up replicas, provide a fault tolerant service and all that uh, without service disruption. In our case, we'll see the self-healing abilities, but uh, the service will be disrupted while the service is being healed. So uh, we've got a metadata, we've got a label with app equals k music stack, uh, and then here's our container list. First container is called IceCast. It pulls from my Docker hub, slash IceCast, call and latest. Uh, we're, we're telling Kubernetes that the container port ought to be provided at 8,000, and we've defined a liveness probe which is an HTTP GET type probe, so it looks for a 200 response at an endpoint, which is root at port 8000. Next container is MPD, more of the same, except now we're defining volume mounts as well. This is the same style of, uh, of configuration as the Docker Compose script before. We're just doing uh, we just have to define it in a, in a little bit different way. You'll see that the volume mount defines a mount path which is inside the container. So the container is going to take whatever my mount path is and send it to varlib MP, mpd music. It's going to do this with a volume that I provision called mpd-music and it's going to mount it uh, as read-write. Read only, false, right, read-write. So let's scroll down and take a look at the volume definition real quick. 
the very bottom, we've got volumes. MPD music is defined as a host path. That's on my local system. It's going to pull this path and call it a volume and slap a name on it. The name is MPD music. The path is my path to the music, user Mars code. Um, so I've actually got a different path here than we used before, K it's 101 Icecast Music. Um, update that to your appropriate directory wherever you curled those MP3s down earlier. Um, we've also defined two other volumes here. We've got MPD Playlists and MPD-DV. These are the three things that MPD needs to start, and they are in MPD's uh, configuration file that we'll take a look at in a little bit. If I scroll back up, we can make sure that the volume mounts the mount paths match the names that we defined in our volumes below. MPD Music, MPD Playlists, MPD DV. Uh, oh, also we define, we define a liveness probe for MPD in a little bit different way than we do a web service. So IceCast serves over 8,000, right? It's got a web server listening. It will re report a 200 when everything's okay. MPD, however, doesn't, right? We know that it's exposing something over 6600, but it's not a web server, so it won't respond 200 if we ask for it. A real easy ghetto way to make sure that your container is up is to exec a command of whatever. I chose hostname in this case. So as long as the OS is ready, the hostname command returns a thing. As long as it doesn't exit non-zero, then the pod is live, or the, the container is live. And that's basically our entire manifest. Uh, that is everything that we defined in our Docker Compose config, with uh, written in a way that Kubernetes knows how to understand and implement all of the associated resources for deployment, pod, uh, not service in this case, uh, because we define our services in these other separate files. You don't have to do this. I like to separate uh, each type of spec that I define. I like to put my deployments in one file, my services in another file. Uh, you don't have to. You can cram them all into one file if you want. Uh, it's all personal preference, whatever you want to do. So let's take a look at one of these services. Oops. Like Icecast, for example. This is what a service manifest looks like, a service spec. Same things, API version, kind, metadata, except our kind is now service. We define our spec with a selector, app, kh music stack. Uh, that's just for housekeeping for this case. Now, here's the actual bit that exposes the service on a given port. We've got the name of a service, we we'll just call it IceCast. Uh, it pulls uh, port 8000 from inside the container, target port from the layer in between the container and Minikube, and the node port on the other side of Minikube, the part that we get to talk to. So it's exposing at 31,001 uh, at whatever the address is of the Minikube master. The rest of the services look very similar. Right, we got MPD, we're exposing some ports. We got some selectors on there, we give it a name, awesome. And then finally, YMPD. Uh, y, YMPD. Same deal. Uh, notice that MPD did not get a node port because we don't actually care to talk to it. MPD's sole purpose in life is to tell IceCast what to do. So as long as it can talk to IceCast, that's all we care about. Uh, YMPD, however, is the interface for MPD. We do want to talk to that, so we give it a node port. In this case, 31002. Uh, SEMA is the same. We don't, we don't actually care to provide a uh, service for that at all. It's all inside the cluster. It does whatever it does if it wants to. We don't care about it in this case, so I'm just going to leave that out. Those are all of our configurations. And we go through the configs here, go through the deployment here, there. Once again, don't use uh, uh, you always use absolute paths when you're talking about volume mounts, um, es especially in the case of a host path. Uh, don't use your, your tilde shortcut for home directory, for example. Um, 
Yeah, so once we have all this together, we can apply the entire folder worth of configurations with kubectl apply dash f path to the configs. So kubectl, uh, uh, I'm in Kate, so I'll go back here. So kubectl apply f path to my configs. Boom. Kubernetes now has my music stack. Now, I, I, I ran the get pods a little early, so we can see that we got a name, 0, 4 already, and the status is container created. So right now, Kubernetes is looking at Docker Hub, at the path that I provided, mar64 slash kate dash music dash stack. It's looking at all the containers that exist there, pulling them down, configuring them. It's applying the configurations that I, that I provided for it, and it's deploying them in this runtime in this pod here. So if we wait a little bit and get it again, poof, everything's running. 404 already. Now once again, uh, because we included the service files in the application, uh, when, when we applied everything, the services were created for us automatically, right? So now if I go to Minikube service list, boom, IceCast, MPD, YMPD, they're all in the, in the list. Uh, only IceCast and YMPD have been exposed, as we discussed earlier. So once again, Minikoop, service, IceCast. Now, it's gonna, we're in the same place, right? But now we're hitting it at the Docker address, at the port that we bound to the service. We go to administration. Uh, we can see that my config changes have been applied. Uh, deep base station nine, right? And if we go to our mount point list, there's nothing there because we have to queue it up with YMPD. Minikoop service YMPD. Boom, it gives us our interface. Let's browse database. Awesome, our, our files are there. So I'll click each one. I'm going to go ahead and enable crossfade and repeat. I'll go to the queue and play. And if my player is correctly functioning, uh, which it's not. Oh, wait, sorry. Uh, so my player was, was actually pointed at the old localhost address. That's no longer the address, right? So we got to go back to IceCast, mount point list. Let's grab a new M3U. Open that guy. Mars 64 radio, that was one of the updates I made in the MPD conf. And there we go. Music stack is up and running. Whoop. What have I done? Uh oh. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. Now, to wrap up this lab, where am I at? All right, so we did all this. We looked at the Minikoop service. There's our XCAST page. We saw that. We saw that uh, all of our configs got updated. We can describe the pod now. Uh, let's get the pod first. Lots more logs in this case, right? The, these are all logs from the kubelet. Basically, that they were it was able to pull the container, schedule it, all that stuff. We can see. So, notice I described the pod, right? When I described this pod, we've got four containers running inside of it. So all the containers are listed here. We've got our IceCast container, our MPD container. Here's our SEMA container, even if it's not happy. YMPD. Of particular note, here in the MPD container, we see all of our mounts. Now notice that it's mount path inside the container provided by the volume name that we prescribed in our config file.
All right. Now that we've got our ice cast system up, I'm curious if you guys are following along. Have you updated paths, pulled the MP3s? Is everyone's local ice cast system running? No? Did you guys want to? You guys want to follow along or? Mostly. Is there? Is, do you guys want to do the troubleshooting? Like, uh, part of the lab is I want to get you guys functional here. Yeah. Um, I think I'm running into problems that I'm running. I'm on a Windows box running VBox, and then mm -hmm. it seems just I need to have VirtualBox running inside of mine to run it. I've got Windows on the outside. I've got VBox where I've got an Ubuntu image where I'm trying to run all this. And apparently uh, you've got to have virtual, so I can't have yeah. virtual box running inside of virtual right. box. Right. Well, you can. I, right. right. In this case, it's running yes, in that. Okay. Because, so when you start Minikoo, you give it a provider, right? Your provider is virtual box. Right. If Minikoo can't talk to the provider, then, it, then Minikoo itself isn't going to do the right thing. So, uh, I so don't, I've just been kind of turning on issues related to that. Gotcha. Yeah, sorry. The Minikoo okay. and, and, and virtual box need to exist side by side. So let's, um, we're nearly done with lab two here, so let's get through this and uh, then we can, uh, we can move back and we can troubleshoot this. Or we yeah. can go ahead and install VirtualBox and get that rolling and then we can get back to the Okay. Any other issues you guys want to talk about? Where's that downloading the MP3 on the uh, last thing? Uh, yeah, so if you go to, where is it? I think it's in the Docker Lab, actually. If you go back to the Docker Lab tiddler, module three there, and scroll all the way down to the bottom of this tiddler, there's, what's that? It's in the bottom of the page. Oh, function right, but, uh, but it's not the, you don't want the bottom of the page, you want the bottom of the tiddler. So you can page down with function down. You can do that, or function right is end, right? So you can go all the way down if you want. But, but there's more stuff open underneath it. So keep going right there. Curl, LO, rinse and repeat radio, blah, 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 to m dot mp3. So if you uh, pull that down wherever you like, it doesn't really matter where the path is, as long as the volume mount reflects, or the volume definition, rather, reflects the correct host. Right. Right. Yeah. So, I'll do that. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Anything else, Seth? I actually wasn't even going along because I heard, uh, I heard you say, let's not destroy the bandwidth here. So it was like, oh, well, okay. Oh, sorry. Go along with the lab. Uh, <laughs> it's all right. I can probably quickly catch up. Sure. Cool. And we can we can do this after too. So. Okay, I was planning on going and doing the lives again myself. Cool. Later cool. On, so. All the files are out there. Um, I've got the MP3s self-hosted. I'm not going to move them, at least not right now. So they're available for the foreseeable future. Cool. Um, but again, all you need is a 128k MP3. Um, or get a 320. Define uh, the bitrate in the IceCast XML file. Mm -hmm. That'll work too. So if you don't have 128 slant around, just redefine it and then it can take. Cool. Yeah. If you're going to deploy this, let's say on a production cluster, uh, and you're doing the volume mounts, would you rather, for this sort of uh, ice cast, would you rather use like NFS or EBS platform? So uh, to our conversation earlier, this is not very high IO, right? We're talking 128K a second, uh, kilobit per second, right? It's not much. So you can do that with a low I/O back. EFS sounds good. I haven't tried it. Uh, that's what I. That's where I would start. Something, you know, low cost, low throughput, right? Not not glacier low, but you know low. Um, now, that's not to say that. So like in a production environment. One of, one of the reasons I bring this up and one of the directions that I'd like to go with this lab is, okay, you've got one ice cast radio. What if I want 20? 
right? Mm -hmm. Now now you start talking about a little bit higher I.O., then you have to redesign your backing accordingly. Yeah. Uh, where are we at here? <laughs> All right, so... Now that we have our radio station running, now we can uh, now we can redemonstrate the magic of Kubernetes by instigating a failure. So let's shell into the IceCast container, kill it, the same thing we did with Docker Compose, right? Where it didn't come back. We're gonna kill the pod and watch what happens. So first of all. Let's get our pots. We've got four of four ready, right? We've already described the pots, so we know what four containers are in there. Uh, if I kubectl exec into the pod, uh, just for demonstration purposes, if I wanted to, if I wanted to bash into my pod, my pods consist of four containers. What happens next? Defaulting container name to IceCast. It's the first container that was defined in my config. You can go to any container, you just have to give it the argument, right? Dash C, IceCast. Oh gosh, what am I doing? And I don't actually have bash in my path, that's fine. Let's provide shell. And boom, I'm in my IceCast container. Um, we see our PID1 of IceCast. Now, separately, I'm going to open a new window here. Make sure that I can connect to my cluster. Now, let's watch the container status, or the pod status, rather, as we, oh, I? As we kill all IceCast. Boom, IceCast is dead, the music should stop. Gone. My playlist and my player is still looping, or should be looping. Uh, we see that when we killed the, the container, Kubernetes immediately noticed, said, oh, I've only got three of my four requested things ready. Let's go ahead and kick it back off. Kubernetes immediately reprovisioned the container in my pod that failed. Awesome. Uh, if I minikube service list, we already know that we want the service YMPD so that we can go requeue everything. Let's requeue all the things. And hit uh, dirt, 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 play. Play? Please? And if my player is looping correctly, anybody? There it is. So we just kicked the legs out from underneath this pod, watched Kubernetes reprovision it, and our service is back online. Uh, because of the nature of YMPD, it's a it's a user interface. You have to go in there and queue things and hit play. Because of that, I had to go back in and click things, but the service recovered itself. Just because one pod, one container of the pod failed, the entire pod could fail, any number of services inside the pod could fail, Kubernetes reprovisioned the whole thing for me, and I didn't have to touch it other than because of how my application was built, queue up a song and hit play. That's the magic of Kubernetes. That's self-healing in a nutshell, and uh, that's... That's that delicious Kool-Aid. Mm -hmm. Would there be a way that you could have like IMPD have like a default playlist set up so that you can have a recovery that? Yes, absolutely. Um, that's what that playlist host mount can hold playlists in it. All you gotta do is you can actually make them in YMPD even. And since I mounted the volume mount uh, read write, uh, it can write the playlist file out for me. Um, and then there's some flag that you can provide to auto load the playlist and then auto play the playlist. Um, I just haven't gotten there yet. Is there a way to also save like offset playlist for when it stops so it can just like come back and keep on the 
That, I don't know. Uh, if YMPD fails, probably not. But YMPD itself, by default, will keep track of uh, playback. So, like, if I if I stop this one, um, oops, that was good. Oh well, if I if I pause, at least it knows where where it was last, um, and there's something in here for I forget settings maybe. I don't remember. Sorry, I don't. I don't actually know in this software, but uh, I believe yes, it can resume playback at a position. Uh, namely, if you have multiple mount points presented to IceCast, for example, IceCast can say, "I have a new mount point. MPD, you're talking to me. Hold on. Stop. Pause. Whatever. Play the new mount point when that you know live DJ whatever. When live DJ disconnects, okay, MPD, you can now resume." Right, that's that is a function of IceCast. Alrighty. Uh, the remainder of the lab here is just looking at ways to uh, debug your instance. Uh, we looked at kubectl get events earlier for uh, master events or kubelet events, or uh, sorry, master events. We looked at kubectl. Uh, oh, we didn't actually forgot about this one. Um, you can get the logs, uh, back to our log discussion earlier, you can get the logs directly from the pod. So let's see what our pod name is. Logs, name of the pod, or pod slash name of the pod. Now, because we have four containers, there's actually four sets of logs in here, right? So let's get logs for the container, IceCast. Boom. These are just warnings, nothing to be concerned about for IceCast, but <clears throat> They're telling me that my host name wasn't configured, so it's using the default value. Um, that's only a problem for the IceCast yellow pages listings. That's this white YP directory listings here. Uh, and then it's having some problem opening some MIME types, but it doesn't matter because all I wanted to demonstrate was MP3. So if you had some other types, then that might be interesting. Um, let's look at MPD. Here's all the MPD logs for things that have happened while we were messing with things. Um, oh, failed to create a state. Oh, to your point, that's probably why it didn't work yet. So, I, I must have goofed a config in there somewhere, but let's look at YMPD. YMPD found MPD at localhost 6600 and it connected. Uh, I don't think we'll have anything for SEMA. Oh, it does. This is why SEMA's not running. Some Python uh -huh. crash, but whatever. I'm not worried about that. Uh, so that's logs. Kubectl get events for system logs. Uh, or sort it by, what was it? Last, last scene? Last timestamp? Like that. Um, you can also get basic logs by describing your resource. So uh, get pods, kubectl, describe pod, the pod name. There's a bunch of logs from the kubelet there at the bottom. Yeah, these are these are methods of debugging your deployment, your your object, whatever it is you're trying to look at. And that's it. When we're done, we clean up. Let's find our deployment. Delete, deploy. Okay, it's music stack, and the music should stop. There it goes. Let's get our services. Delete service IceCast, MPD, YMPD, that should be it. Awesome. You don't want to delete the Kubernetes service. Uh, and that's it. That is the end of lab two, and that was the self-healing ability that I intended to demonstrate for this class. Uh, that's what I think the, um, the number one, the easy sell of Kubernetes is this self-healing biz. There are many other uh, really useful ways that Kubernetes can solve problems, but, uh, but that's for another class, I think.
Um, the last module that I have, and I do see that we are basically out of time. We've got two minutes left. I'm happy to stay later if you guys like. Um, I wanted to put out some ideas for things that you would consider for production readiness for a system like this. Every infrastructure is going to be a little bit different, uh, particularly based on your provider, right? Um, there's AWS, there's GCR or GKE, or not GCI, GCE, Google Compute Engine or Container Engine, uh, GKE, Google Kubernetes something. I don't think it's engine, I think it means something else. Um, it's basically hosted Kubernetes. Uh, you can do it on-premises. Uh, I've actually got, uh, at RetournPath, we have two AWS-based instances and two VMware-based instances. Uh, there are pros and cons to each. Um, but yeah, I wanted to open this part up to discussion for whatever questions you guys might have about anything, about uh, Docker, about Kubernetes, about the labs, about how to productionize. Um, here are some topics that we can discuss if you guys don't have anything else or uh, you guys are sick of hearing me talk. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, what are some of the pros and cons of uh, on-prem versus cloud? Components? So each each cloud provider has its own own things, right? Um, for example, if you're going to deploy into Amazon, there's a really cool tool. James and I were talking about it earlier called Kube-AWS. If you if it's Google Kube-AWS, uh, it's it's a really cool like one script build me a cluster in Amazon Go type script and. Uh, it's, it's really, really quite fascinating. Uh, you can define multi-master, multi-everything. You can define your, uh, you, you can just define everything with the Kube AWS script. Um, that is the outcome of a Kubernetes special interest group, SIG, SIG, uh, SIG, whatever it is. I think SIG Kube AWS is what it is. Um, that's one of their Slack channels. That's one of the mailing lists. You can get involved with those guys directly if you're interested. Um, Kube AWS provides a real uh, simple way to stand up a cluster. Now, that also provides a very simple way to destroy an entire cluster, right? Um, just like Minikube delete or whatever, or Minikube uh, stop, whatever. Uh, so if you're going to go AWS, that's one of the things, is you have easy way to deploy with Kube AWS, right? Uh, in AWS, it's not hosted Kubernetes, right? So you have to define multi-master, multi-worker, uh, uh, you have to split out your key value store, right? Uh, by default, we use a technology called etcd. It's, uh, it's a cluster of systems that uh, they have a highly resilient um, protocol for sharing data in the store uh, to make sure that the objects are what you want them to be, right? So every time you launch a configuration, every time you launch a manifest or a spec, it gets stored in the etcd store so if you want ultra resilience, you probably want like five etcd nodes, right? Uh, they all have to form a quorum in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, data consistency. So to ensure that everything knows what's going on, you want a, an odd number of three or more uh, nodes. Um, you can do all that through Kube AWS. Let's talk about GKE real quick though. GKE provides a managed Kubernetes service. They provide you masters, and they manage the update cycle. That could be good, it could be bad, depending on your scenario, right? Platform as a service rather than just data structure. Right, right. You get to control your worker nodes, but pretty much everything else Google does for you. That could be very nice if you are designing things in, in, you know, in a way that Google might call proper, right? If, if all of your objects work nicely with their upgrades, no big deal. If they don't, then Google's going to update, and you got to deal with it. Your app might be down. You're going to have to figure out what the bug is and sort it yourself. Um, pros and cons there, right? Uh, VMware. Do you want on-prem Kubernetes? Uh, really, the the biggest pro to on-prem, in my opinion, is you get to manage all of the backing services yourself. That's if you even want to, right? Uh, the problem with that is that you don't, out of the box, get things like annotations for SSL, annotations for, um, for really anything fancy. You, uh, if you're if you're hosting in VMware, let's let's call it let's call it VMware like classic vSphere, right? vCenter, uh, 
n n none of the fancy cloud provider stuff. If you're just doing VMs and VMware, then you don't get things like load balancers, right? You can't say in, in your spec, hey, VMware, give me a load balancer. VMware doesn't know what that is, right? You have to install plugins to VMware to be able to handle that for you. Um, uh, storage classes, right? If you want to uh, back the Amazon case, if you want to back one of your pods with an EBS volume, you can do that in Amazon by providing an annotation. Give me an EBS volume that looks like this, has these capacities, and assign it to a per persistent volume claim and claim it on this deployment or whatever. Uh, VMware, you can't do that natively. You have to you have to install it's helper software. software to do it. Yeah. Uh, so there's some 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 pros and cons to a couple of solutions there. Yeah. Um, anything? Any other questions? As far as having a number of containers underneath a single IP address, um, so you're not. Um, how are you load balancing any of the masters? So the the masters don't actually load balance. Um, in the event you have multi-master, multi-key uh, value store. The key value store actually stores a config that says who the master is. Uh, it locks that configuration for the duration of, uh, for some duration. Uh, when you have multi-master, let's say you have three masters, they actually race for locks against the key value store. So you only ever have one master at a time that's calling the shots, uh, but which one gets to call the shots is defined by a config that's stored in that Okay. So the masters themselves aren't load balanced in that sense. They are redundant, they're resilient, right? Um, right. But they're not load balanced, they're racing for locks. Um, to your, your, uh, the earlier part of that question about single IP addresses, um, our lab was single node, master key value store node, all runs on one thing in Minikube, right? Um, in, that, in that instance, yeah, you've got one exposed address, uh, you have you may have many addresses underneath, right? The uh, the host uh, the host based network that gets created by VirtualBox in our case could have multiple addresses, but the only thing that you get to interact with is yes, one address. In a production environment, uh, when you're deploying multiple services that have uh, you know let's say scaled replicas, you know multi replicas that all contribute to serving the same service, you would put those behind a load balancer of some sort there's your IP address on the other side. You don't manage that inside Kubernetes. Uh, you want your service provider to do that. That's why I pointed out load balancing at AWS earlier, because you can provide an annotation that says, give me this thing, it's gonna have an address on it. You can provide annotations to, for example, automatically update Route 53 when my ELB comes online with some endpoint, right? Um, that way you can get a hands-off way to provision multiple services behind a load balancer that automatically get a DNS name. Let's say you've got a C name on your website uh, that points to your ELB endpoint. Now you've got multiple things that work in conjunction to, and you don't have to touch it. Right. You just deploy the annotation and all the magic happens for you. There are some bugs with that instance. <laughs> um, but but yeah, it, when, when all of the cloud providers uh, really battle test their configurations. That's the idea, is you'll be able to say, annotation for XYZ, I've got a CNAME in DNS that points to the ELB endpoint, I deploy my configuration, everything connects itself. That's the idea. Okay, but you're always running it with a load balancer of some kind? Uh, or in production? In production, you, you probably want to, yeah. Um, especially when you have uh, replica sets greater than one, right? Um, uh, you know, I haven't dug into that one much yet. The ingress being a service type. It's like a, it's like a, uh, uh, what you call it? It's a, it's a service. Yeah, it's basically running like an HA proxy here in Nginx with some special sauce that Kubernetes will say, oh, go to this pod. Oh, I see what you're saying. Right. Yeah. 
Um, so uh, just to wrap up a few things here, uh, I wanted to point out the last thing down here, pod design. Um, Sidecars are awesome and everybody should be using them, <laughs> is, is the, the short version of it. Uh, out at DevOps Days, where I saw David and Anthony last time, uh, there was a real fantastic talk by Greg Poirier on sidecar design. And uh, it, it was a fantastic talk. We can post it up. I can, I'll throw it in the wiki and, and update GitHub or something. Um, but uh, when you have a service, that requires backing services that you don't want to provide, um, sidecars are, are generally the answer. In our case, IceCast was the, it's, that's the primary service of our pod, right? But IceCast on its own didn't do anything for us. We needed MPD to kick off the music. We needed YMPD to cue it, right? Um, MPD and YMPD, in, in our case, are sidecars. Uh, for example, uh, YMPD didn't require any authentication, right? We can just go straight to it. Uh, as long as we have a network route to it, we can see the admin panel. Um, I, I could be wrong. I think that there is a way in YMPD to, pr to require authentication, but not all services do this. For example, Prometheus is the Kubernetes um, uh, native metrics and monitoring method. Uh, lots of really cool stuff to talk about within the, within the, the topic of, of Prometheus. Um, but the Prometheus team have openly declared that they have no interest to build in authentication or authorization. Now this is metrics and, 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 and measurements that we're talking about for the performance of your application. Generally information you don't want to be public, right? Um, you could firewall it, you could keep it internal, you could do all these things, but even what if you don't want internal folks in there me messing with your metrics, right? Um, right now, the only way to do it is to sidecar an OAuth 2 reverse proxy. Well, not the only way to do it. One way to do it is to sidecar an OAuth 2 reverse proxy. Uh, OAuth is a, uh, was it SAML based uh, single point of auth authorization or authentication, rather? Um, so what you can do is, in your deployment spec, define a container that pulls some OAuth 2 reverse proxy image. There are many out there. I found that it was best for me to build my own because I wanted to apl apply custom configurations. So for my case, I pulled down a, a, whatever it was, an Alpine image. I did an APK add the OAuth software, uh, mount my configuration right here, and then run the OAuth 2 reverse proxy. Um, part of the configuration says, when the request comes inbound, go first to OAuth2, authenticate based off some provider. I chose Google, so we're, we're doing Google authentication. If you have a Google account, you're in our Google organization, and you're authorized to do a thing, then you can log in with your Google account through OAuth. If the result is good, go ahead and pass it on to a container port at blah, whatever it is. In this way, you can control access to otherwise uh, to containers that otherwise don't have access control built into them. Sidecar design, it's awesome. Um, OAuth 2 reverse proxy is probably the most popular thing that I've been doing lately um, for things that require authentication, but uh, there are many, many, many ways that you can go about this. Uh, and for example, in our case, MPD, YMPD, those are both sidecars. Um, yeah, all right. So. The deploy part. So, like, talk about the deployments and, like, okay, you have a new version of your app. How do you uh, upgrade that? You know, ah. Service stand up. Service. Sure, sure. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So, let's say that you have a deployment and the deployment has uh, five replicas, whatever, more than, more than one replica. Um, you can. You can apply in a rolling update fashion uh, with a tag, uh, just dash dash rolling dash update. And uh, Bye guys. thanks, Seth. So Take it easy. Uh, so when when you use this flag when you apply your config, um, Kubernetes will just it knows how to use the flag to say, all right, I got five of these things. I got to update them, but I can't take them all down at once. How am I going to do it? I'm going to take this one first. Okay, 
these four are still processing. All right, this one back up. All right, let's do number two. And then it just rolls through the remaining uh, replica set to ensure service uptime uh, of, of an upgrade of whatever configuration, versions, whatever you got. So, do you have something else in mind? or That was it? Cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, lots of crazy things that you can do with the build deploy steps. Um, I listed continuous integration, continuous deployment here. Uh, I think that in a, in a system like Kubernetes, you're really, uh, it's really, uh, it's really conducive to continuous deployment because uh, you can, like for example, we use Jenkins for builds and uh, for builds and deploys. The deploy piece of it just uses kubectl apply blah, some namespace or whatever it is, a custom script that we provide to it, um, and the build phase will do all of our docker build tag push blah all of that stuff and then the deployment of course is the pull piece of it um, when you're using a system like jenkins you can you can really i mean it's it's really easy to just slap in rolling update for this service with 10 replicas or whatever so you can make all of it happen automatically on pr on merge to master however it is that you control your your code base um, yeah the rabbit hole goes deep. Anything else? All right, well, we're over time. Thank you very much for uh, sticking around and, uh, and following along. All of my contact information is uh, somewhere. It's at least in the slide deck. Uh, if you guys want to get in touch with me, binary.stereo at gmail.com. Uh, uh, I my repo is otherwise pretty empty. I mostly work in a private repo, but any of this stuff I'll be putting up on Mars 64 and GitHub. Um, yeah, hit me up if you guys have any questions. I'm happy to talk about whatever whatever comes to mind. Music, technology, otherwise, snowboarding. Good. Anybody? <laughs> cool. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, Marshall.